The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio, translated by A. M. Rigg. Beginneth here the book called Decameron, otherwise Prince Galeotto, wherein are contained one hundred novels, told in ten days by seven ladies and three young men. Proem. Tis humane to have compassion on the afflicted, and as it shews well in all, so it is especially demanded of those who have had need of comfort and have found it in others, among whom, if any had ever need thereof or found it precious or delectable, I may be numbered, seeing that from my early youth even to the present I was beyond measure aflame with the most aspiring and noble love, more perhaps than were I to enlarge upon it, would seem to accord with my lowly condition, whereby, among people of discernment to whose knowledge it had come, I had much praise and high esteem, but nevertheless extreme discomfort and suffering, not indeed by reason of cruelty on the part of the beloved lady, but through superabundant ardor engendered in the soul by ill brittle desire, the which, as it allowed me no reasonable period of quiescence, frequently occasioned me an inordinate distress, in which distress so much relief was afforded me by the delectable discourse of a friend and his commendable consolations, that I entertain a very solid conviction that to them I owe it that I am not dead. But as it pleased him, who, being infinite, has assigned by immutable law an end to all things mundane, my love, beyond all other fervent, and neither to be broken nor bent by any force of determination, or counsel of prudence, or fear of manifest shame or ensuing danger, did nevertheless in course of time abate of its own accord, in such wise that it has now left naught of itself in my mind, but that pleasure which it is wont to afford to him who does not adventure too far out in navigating its deep seas so that, whereas it was used to be grievous, now, all discomfort being done away, I find that which remains to be delightful. But the cessation of the pain has not banished the memory of the kind offices done me by those who shared my sympathy and burden of my griefs, nor will it ever, I believe, pass from me except by death. And as among the virtues gratitude is in my judgment most especially to be commended, and ingratitude in equal measure to be censured. Therefore, that I show myself not ungrateful, I have resolved, now that I may call myself free, to endeavor, in return for what I have received, to afford, so far as in me lies, some solace, if not to those who succored me, and who perchance, by reason of their good sense or good fortune, need it not, at least to such as may be apt to receive it. And though my support or comfort, so to say, may be of a little avail to the needy, nevertheless it seems to me meet to offer it most readily where the need is most apparent, because it will there be most serviceable and also most kindly received. Who will deny that it should be given, for all that it may be worth, to gentle ladies much rather than to men? Within their soft bosoms, betwixt fear and shame, they harbor secret fires of love, and how much of strength's concealment adds to those fires, they know who have proved it. Moreover, restrained by the will, the caprice, the commandment of fathers, mothers, brothers, and husbands, can find most part of their time within the narrow compass of their chambers. They live, so to say, a life of vacant ease, and yearning and renouncing in the same moment Meditate diverse matters which cannot all be cheerful. If thereby a melancholy bread of amorous desire make entrance into their minds, it's like to tarry there to their sore distress, unless it be dispelled by a change of ideas. Besides which they have much less power to support such a weight than men. For when men are enamored, their case is very different, as we may readily perceive. They if they are afflicted by a melancholy and heaviness of mood, have many ways of relief and diversion. They may go where they will, may hear and see many things, may hawk, hunt, fish, 
ride, play, or traffic, by which means all are able to compose their minds, either in whole or in part, and repair a ravage wrought by the dumpish mood, at least for some space of time. And shortly after, by one way or another, either solace ensues, or the dumps become less grievous. Wherefore, in some measure, to compensate the injustice of fortune, which to those whose strength is less, as we see it to be in the delicate frames of ladies, has been most niggard of support, I, for the succor and diversion of such of them as love, for others may find sufficient solace in the needle and the spindle and the reel, do intend to recount one hundred novels or fables or parables or stories, as we may please to call them, which were recounted in ten days by an honourable company of seven ladies and three young men, in the time of the late mortal pestilence, as also some consonants, sung by the said ladies for their delectation in which pleasant novels will be found some passages of love rudely crossed, with other courses of events of which the issues are felicitous, in times as well modern as ancient, from which stories the said ladies, who shall read them, may derive both pleasure from the entertaining matters set forth therein, and also good counsel, in that they may learn what to shun, and likewise what to pursue which cannot, I believe, come to pass, unless the dumps are banished by diversion of mind. And if it so happen, as God grant it may, let them give thanks to love, who, liberating me from his fetters, has given me the power to devote myself to their gratification. End of poem. Day the First. The Introduction. Beginneth here the first day of the Decameron in which, when the author has set forth how it came to pass that the persons who appear hereafter met together for interchange of discourse, they, under the rule of Pompinea, discourse of such matters as most commend themselves to each in turn. As often, most gracious ladies, as I bethink me, how compassionate you are by nature, one and all, I do not disguise from myself that the present work must seem to you to have but a heavy and distressful prelude, in that it bears upon its very front, what must needs revive the sorrowful memory of the late mortal pestilence, the course whereof was grievous not merely to eyewitnesses, but to all who in any other wise had cognizance of it. But I would have you know, that you need not therefore be fearful to read further, as if your reading were ever to be accompanied by sighs and tears. This horrid beginning will be to you even such as to wayfarers is a steep and rugged mountain, beyond which stretches a plain most fair and delectable, which the toil of the ascent and descent does but serve to render more agreeable to them. For as the last degree of joy brings with it sorrow, so misery has ever its sequel of happiness. To this brief exordium of woe, Brief, I say, inasmuch as it can be put within the compass of a few letters, succeed forthwith the sweets and delights which I have promised you, and which perhaps, had I not done so, were not to have been expected from it. In truth, had it been honestly possible to guide you whither I would bring you, by a road less rough than this will be, I would gladly have so done. But because without this review of the past, it would be not be in my power to shew how the matters, of which you will hereafter read, came to pass. I am almost bound of necessity to enter upon it, if I would write of them at all. I say, then, that the years of the beatific incarnation of the Son of God had reached the tale of 1348, when in the illustrious city of Florence, the fairest of all the cities of Italy, there made its appearance the deadly pestilence, which, whether disseminated by the influence of the celestial bodies, or sent upon us mortals by God, in his just wrath, by way of retribution for our iniquities, had had its origin some years before in the East, whence, after destroying an innumerable multitude of living beings, it had propagated itself without respite from place to place, and so, calamitously had spread into the West. 
in Florence, despite all that human wisdom and forethought could devise to avert it, as the cleansing of the city from many impurities by officials appointed for the purpose, the refusal of entrance to all sick folk, and the adoption of many precautions for the preservation of health. Despite also humble supplications addressed to God, and often repeated both in public procession and otherwise, by the devout, towards the beginning of the spring of the said year, the doleful effects of the pestilence began to be horribly apparent by symptoms that shewed as if miraculous. Not such were they as in the East, where an issue of blood from the nose was a manifest sign of inevitable death, but in men and women alike it first betrayed itself by the emergence of certain tumours in the groin or the armpits, some of which grew as large as a common apple, others as an egg, some more, some less, which the common folk called gavoccioli. From the two said parts of the body this deadly gavoccioli soon began to propagate, and spread itself in all directions indefinitely after which the form of the malady began to change. Black spots, or livid making, their appearance in many cases on the arm, or the thigh, or elsewhere, now few and large, now minute and numerous. And as the Gavacciolo had been, and still was an infallible token of approaching death, such also were these spots, on whomsoever they shewed themselves. Which malady seemed to set entirely at naught, both the art of the physician and the virtues of physic. Indeed, whether it was that the disorder was of a nature to defy such treatment, or that the physicians were at fault, besides the qualified there was now a multitude both of men and of women, who practised without having received the slightest tincture of medical science, and being in ignorance of its source, failed to apply the proper remedies. In either case, not merely were those that recovered few, but almost all, within three days from the appearance of the said symptoms, sooner or later, died, and in most cases without any fever or other attendant malady. Moreover, the virulence of the pest was the greater by reason that intercourse was apt to convey it from the sick to the whole, just as fire devours things dry or greasy when they are brought close to it. Nay, the evil went yet further, for not merely by speech or association with the sick was the malady communicated to the healthy, with consequent peril of common death, but any that touched the clothes of the sick or aught else that had been touched or used by them seemed thereby to contract the disease. So marvellous sound that, which I have now to relate, that, had not many and I among them, observed it with their own eyes, I had hardly dared to credit it, much less to set it down in writing, though I had had it from the lips of a credible witness. I say, then, that such was the energy of the contagion of the said pestilence, that it was not merely propagated from man to man, but what is much more startling, it was frequently observed that things which had belonged to one sick or dead of the disease, if touched by some other living creature, not of the human species, were the occasion not merely of sickening, but of an almost instantaneous death, whereof my own eyes, as I said a little before, had cognizance, one day among others, by the following experience. The rags of a poor man, who had died of the disease, being strewn about the open street, two hogs came thither, and after, as is their wont, no little trifling with their snouts, took the rags between their teeth, and tossed them to and fro about their chaps, whereupon almost immediately they gave a few turns, and fell down dead, as if by poison, upon the rags which in an evil hour they had disturbed. In which circumstances, not to speak of many others of a similar or even graver complexion, diverse apprehensions and imaginations were engendered in the minds of such as were left alive, inclining almost all of them to the same harsh resolution, to wit, to shun and abhor all contact with the sick, and all that belonged to them, thinking thereby to make each his own health secure. Among whom there were those who thought that to live temperately, and avoid all excess, would count for much, as a preservative against seizures of this kind. Wherefore they banded together, and dissociating themselves from all others, formed communities in houses, 
for there were no sick, and lived a separate and secluded life, which they regulated with the utmost care, avoiding every kind of luxury, but eating and drinking very moderately of the most delicate wines and the finest wines, holding converse with none but one another, lest the tidings of sickness or death should reach them, and diverting their minds with music and such other delights as they could devise. Other, the bias of whose minds was in the opposite direction, maintained that to drink freely frequent places of public resort, and take their pleasure with song and revel, sparing to satisfy no appetite, and to laugh and mock at no event, was the sovereign remedy for so great an evil, and that which they affirmed they also put in practice, so far as they were able, resorting day and night, now to this tavern, now to that, drinking with an entire disregard of rule or measure, and by preference making the houses of others, as it were, their ends, if they but saw in them aught that was particularly to their taste or liking, which they were readily able to do, because the owners, seeing death imminent, had become a reckless of their property as of their lives, so that most of the houses were open to all comers, and no distinction was observed between the stranger who presented himself and the rightful lord. Thus, adhering even to their inhuman determination to shun the sick, as far as possible, they ordered their life. In this extremity of our city's suffering and tribulation, the venerable authority of laws, human and divine, was abased and all but totally dissolved, for lack of those who should have administered and enforced them, most of whom, like the rest of the citizens, were either dead or sick, or so hard bested by servants that they were unable to execute any office whereby every man was free to do what was right in his own eyes. Not a few there were who belonged to neither of the two said parties, but kept a middle course between them, neither laying the same restraint upon their diet as the former, nor allowing themselves the same license in drinking and other dissipations as the latter, but living with a degree of freedom sufficient to satisfy their appetites, and not as recluses. They therefore walked abroad, carrying in their hands flowers of fragrant herbs, or diverse sorts of spices, which they frequently raised to their noses, deeming it an excellent thing thus to comfort the brain with such perfumes, because the air seemed to be everywhere laden and reeking with the stench emitted by the dead and the dying, and the odors of drugs. Some again, the most sound perhaps in judgment, as they were also the most harsh in temper of all, affirmed that there was no medicine for the disease, superior or equal in efficiency, to flight, following which prescription a multitude of men and women, negligent of all but themselves, deserted their city, their houses, their estates, their kinsfolk, their goods, and went into voluntary exile, or migrated to the country parts, as if God, in visiting men with this pestilence, in requital of their iniquities, would not pursue them with his wrath wherever they might be, but intended the destruction of such alone as remained within the circuit of the walls of the city, or deeming perchance that it was now time for all to flee from it, and that its last hour was come. Of the adherents of these diverse opinions, not all died, neither did all escape, but rather there were, of each sort and in every place, many that second, and by those who retained their health, were treated after the example which they themselves, while whole, had set, being everywhere left to languish in almost total neglect. Tedious were it to recount how to citizen avoided citizen, how among neighbors was scarce found any that shewed fellow feeling for another, how kinsfolk held aloof, and never met, or but rarely, enough that this sore affliction entered so deep into the minds of men and women, that in the horror thereof, brother was forsaken by brother, nephew by uncle, brother by sister, and oftentimes husband by wife, nay, what is more, and scarcely to be believed, fathers and mothers were found to abandon their own children, untended and visited to their fate, as if they had been strangers. Wherefore the sick of both sexes, whose number could not be estimated, were left without resource but in the charity of friends, and few such there were, 
or in the interest of servants who were hardly to be had at high rates and on unseemly terms and being moreover one and all men and women of gross understanding and for the most part unused to such offices concerned themselves no further than to supply the immediate and expressed wants of the sick and to watch them die in which service they themselves not seldom perished with their gains in consequence of which dearth of servants and dereliction of the sick by neighbors kinsfolk and friends it came to pass a thing perhaps never before heard of that no woman however dainty fair or well born she might be shrank when stricken with the disease from the ministrations of a man no matter whether he were young or no or scrupled to expose to him every part of her body with no more shame than if he had been a woman submitting of necessity to that which her malady required wherefrom perchance there resulted in after times some loss of modesty in such as recovered besides which many succumbed who with proper attendance would perhaps have escaped death so that what with the virulence of the plague and the lack of due tendance of the sick the multitude of the deaths that daily and nightly took place in the city was such that those who heard the tale not to say witnessed the fact were struck dumb with amazement whereby practices contrary to the former habits of the citizens could hardly fail to grow up among the survivors it had been as to-day it still is the custom for the women that were neighbors and of kin to the deceased to gather in his house with the women that were most closely connected with him to wail with them in common while on the other hand his male kinsfolk and neighbors was not a few of the other citizens and the due proportion of the clergy according to his quality assembled without in front of the house to receive the corpse and so the dead man was borne on the shoulders of his peers with funeral pomp of taper and dirge to the church selected by him before his death which rites at the pestilence waxed in fury were either in whole or in great part disused and gave way to others of a novel order for not only did no crowd of women surround the bed of the dying but many passed from this life unregarded and few indeed were they to whom were accorded the lamentations and bitter tears of sorrowing relations nay for the most part their place was taken by the laugh the jest the festal gathering observances which the woman domestic piety in large measure set aside had adopted with very great advantage to their health few also there were whose bodies were attended to the church by more than ten or twelve of their neighbors and those not the honorable and respected citizens but a sort of corpse carriers drawn from the baser ranks who called themselves becini and performed such offices for hire would shoulder the bier and with hurried steps carry it not to the church of the dead man's choice but to that which was nearest at hand with four or six priests in front and a candle or two or perhaps none nor did the priests distress themselves with too long or solemn an office but with the aid of the piccini hastily consigned the corpse to the first tomb which they found untenanted the condition of the lower and perhaps in great measure of the middle ranks of the people showed even worse and more deplorable for deluded by hope or constrained by poverty they stayed in their quarters in their houses where they sickened by thousands a day and being without service or help of any kind were so to speak irredeemably devoted to the death which overtook them many died daily or nightly in the public streets of many others who died at home the departure was hardly observed by their neighbors until the stench of their putrefying bodies carried the tidings and what with their corpses and the corpses of others who died on every hand the whole place was a sepulchre it was the common practice of most of the neighbors moved no less by fear of contamination by the putrefying bodies than by charity towards the deceased to drag the corpses out of the houses with their own hands aided perhaps by a porter if a porter was to be had and to lay them in front of the doors where any one who made the round might have seen especially in the morning more of them than he could count afterwards they would have beers brought up or in default planks whereupon they laid them nor was it once or twice only that one and the same beer carried two or three corpses at once but quite a considerable number of such cases occurred 
one beer sufficing for husband and wife, two or three brothers, father and son, and so forth. And times without number it happened, that, as two priests, bearing the cross, were on their way to perform the last office for someone, three or four beers were brought up by the porters in rear of them, so that, whereas the priests supposed that they had but one corpse to bury, they discovered that there were six or eight, or sometimes more. Nor, for all their number, were their obsequies honoured by either tears or lights or crowds of mourners. Rather, it was come to this, that a dead man was then of no more account than a dead goat would be to-day. From all which it is abundantly manifest, that that lesson of patient resignation, which the sages were never able to learn from the slight and infrequent mishaps which occur in the natural course of events, was now brought home, even to the minds of the simple, by the magnitude of their disasters, so that they became indifferent to them. As consecrated ground there was not in extent sufficient to provide tombs for the vast multitude of corpses, which day and night, and almost every hour, were brought in eager haste to the churches for interment, least of all, if ancient custom were to be observed, and a separate resting place assigned to each. They dug for each graveyard, as soon as it was full, a huge trench, in which they laid the corpses, as they arrived by hundreds at a time, filling them up as merchandise is stowed in the hold of a ship, tier upon tier, each covered with a little earth, until the trench could hold no more. But I spared to rehearse with minute particularity each of the woes that came upon our city, and say in brief, that, harsh as was the tenor of her fortunes, the surrounding country knew no mitigation, for there, not to speak of the castles, each, as it were, a little city in itself, in sequestered village, or on the open champagne, by the wayside, on the farm, in the homestead, the poor hapless husbands men and their families, forlorn of physicians' care or servants' tenants, perish day and night alike, not as men, but rather as beasts. Wherefore they too, like the citizens, abandoned all rule of life, all habit of industry, all counsel of prudence, nay, one and all, as if expecting each day to be their last, not merely ceased to aid nature to yield her fruit in due season, of their beasts and their lands and their past labours, but left no means unused, which ingenuity could devise, to waste their accumulated store, denying shelter to their oxen, asses, sheep, goats, pigs, foals, nay, even to their dogs, man's most faithful companions, and driving them out into the fields, to roam at large, amid the unsheathed, nay, unreaped corn. Many of which, as if endowed with reason, took their fill during the day, and returned home at night, without any guidance of herdsmen. But enough of the country. What need we add, but, reverting to the city, that such and so grievous was the harshness of heaven, and perhaps in some degree of man, that, what with the fury of the pestilence, the panic of those whom it spared, and their consequent neglect or desertion of not a few of the stricken in their need, it is believed without any manner of doubt that between March and the ensuing July upwards of a hundred thousand human beings lost their lives within the walls of the city of Florence, which before the deadly visitation would not have been supposed to contain so many people. How many grand palaces, how many stately homes, how many splendid residences, once full of retainers, of lords, of ladies, were now left desolate of all, even to the meanest servant. How many families of historic fame, of vast ancestral domains, and wealth proverbial, found now no scheme to continue the succession. Now many brave men, how many fair ladies, how many gallant youths, whom any physician, were he gallant Hippocrates or Asculapius himself, would have pronounced in the soundest of health, broke fast with their kinsfolk, comrades, and friends in the morning, and when evening came, supped with their forefathers in the other world. Irksome it is to myself to rehearse in detail so sorrowful a history. Wherefore, being minded to pass over so much thereof as I fairly can, I say that our city, being thus well nigh depopulated, it so happened, as I afterwards learned from one worthy of credit, 
that on a Tuesday morning, after divine service, the venerable church of Santa Maria Novella was almost deserted, save for the presence of seven young ladies, habited sadly in keeping with the season. All were connected either by blood or at last as friends or neighbors, and fear and of good understanding were they all, as also of noble birth, gentle manners, and a modest sprinkliness. In age none exceeded twenty-eight, or fell short of eighteen years. Their names I would set down in due form, had I not good reason to withhold them, being solicitous lest the matters which there ensue, as told and heard by them, should in after time be occasion of reproach to any of them, in view of the ample indulgence which was then, for the reasons herefore set forth, accorded to the lighter hours of persons, of my triper years than they, but which the manners of to-day have somewhat restricted. Nor would I furnish material to detractors, ever ready to bestow their bite where praise is due, to cast by indivinous speech the least slur upon the honour of these noble ladies. Wherefore, that what each says may be apprehended without confusion, I intend to give them names, more or less appropriate to the character of each. The first, then, being the eldest of the seven, we will call Pompinea, the second, Fiametta, the third, Philomena, the fourth, Emilia, the fifth we will distinguish as Lauretta, the sixth as Neifile, and the last, not without reason, shall be named Elisa. It was not of set purpose, but by mere chance, that these ladies met in the same part of the church, but at length grouping themselves into a sort of circle, after heaving a few sighs, they gave up saying pater nostrus and began to converse, among other topics, on the times. So they continued for a while, and then Pompinea, the rest listening in silent attention, thus began. Dear ladies mine, often have I heard it said, as you doubtless as well as I, that wrong is done to none, by whoso but honestly uses his reason, and to fortify, preserve, and defend his life to the utmost of his power, is the dictate of natural reason in every one that is born, which right is accorded in such measure, that in defence thereof men have been held blameless in taking life. And if this be allowed by the laws, albeit on their stringency, depends the well-being of every mortal, how much more exempt from censure should we, and all other honest folk, be in taking such means as we may, for the preservation of our life? As often as I bethink me, how we have been occupied this morning, and not this morning only, and what has been the tenor of our conversation, I perceive, and you will be readily do the like, that each of us is apprehensive on her own account. Nor there I do I marvel, but at this I do marvel greatly, that though none of us lacks a woman's wit, yet none of us has recourse to any means to avert that which we all justly fear. Here we tarry, as if methinks, for no other purpose than to bear witness to the number of the corpses that are brought hither for the interment, or to hearken, if the brothers there within, whose number is now almost reduced to naught, chant their offices at the canonical hours, or by our weeds of woe to obtrude on the attention of every one that enters the nature and degree of our sufferings. And if we quit the church, we see dead or sick folk carried about, or we see those who for their crimes were of late condemned to exile by the outraged majesty of the public laws, but who now, in contempt of those laws, well knowing that their ministers are a prey to death or disease, have returned, and traverse the city in packs, making it hideous with their riotous antics. Or else we see the refuse of the people, fostered on our blood, vicini, as they call themselves, who for our torment go prancing about here and there and everywhere, making mock of our miseries and querulous songs. Nor hear we aught but, such and such are dead, or such and such are dying, and should hear dolorous wailing on every hand, were there but any to wail. Or go we home, what see we there? I know not if you are in like case with me, but there, where once were servants in plenty, I find none left but my maid, and shudder with terror, and feel the very hairs of my head to stand on end, and turn, or tarry, where I may, I encounter the ghosts of the departed, not with their wanted mien, 
but with something horrible in their aspect that appalls me. For which reason church and street and home are alike distressful to me, and the more so that none, methinks, having means and place of retirement as we have, abides here save only we. Or if any such there be, they are of those, as my senses too often have borne witness, who make no distinction between things honourable and their opposites. So they but answer the cravings of appetite, and alone or in company do daily and nightly what things soever give promise of most gratification. Nor are these secular persons alone, but such as live recluse in monasteries break their rule, and give themselves up to carnal pleasures, persuading themselves that they are permissible to them, and only forbidden to others, and thereby thinking to escape are become unchaste and dissolute. If such be our circumstances, and such most manifestly they are, what do we hear? What we wait for? What dream we of? Why are we less prompt to provide for our own safety than the rest of the citizens? Is life less dear to us than to all other women? Or think we that the bond which unites soul and body is stronger in us than in others, so that there is no blow that may light upon it, of which we need be apprehensive? If so, we err, we are deceived. What insensate folly were it in us to be so believed? We have but to call to mind the number and condition of those young as we, and of both sexes, who have succumbed to this cruel pestilence, to find therein conclusive evidence to the contrary. Unless from lethargy or indolence we fall into the vain imagination, that by some lucky accident we may in some way or another, when we would escape, I know not if your opinion accord with mine. I should deem it most wise in us, our case being what it is, if, as many others have done before us, and are still doing, we were to quit this place, and shunning like death the evil example of others, betake ourselves to the country, and there live as honourable women on one of the estates, of which none of us has any lack, with all cheer of festal gathering and other delights, so long as in no particular we overstep the bounds of reason. There we shall hear the chant of birds, have sight of verdant hills and plains, of cornfields undulating like the sea, of trees of a thousand sorts. There also we shall have a larger view of the heavens, which have ever harsh to usward, yet deny not their eternal beauty, sings fire far to eap to rest on that the desolate walls of our city. Moreover, we shall there breathe the fresh air, find ampler store of things meet for such as live in these times, have fewer causes of annoy. For though the husbandsmen die there, even as here the citizens, they are dispersed in scattered homesteads, and tis thus less painful to witness. Nor so far as I can see is there a soul, here, whom we shall desert, rather we may truly say that we are ourselves deserted, for our kinsfolk being either dead or fled in fear of death, no more regardful of us than if we were strangers. We are left alone in our great affliction. No censure, then, shall fall on us if we do as I propose, and otherwise grievous suffering, perhaps death, may ensue. Wherefore, if you agree, it is my advice, that attended by our maids, with all things needful, we sojourn, now on this, now on the other estate, and in such way of life continue, until we see, if death should not first overtake us, the end which heaven reserves for these events. And I remind you that it will be at least as seemly in us to leave with honour as in others, of whom there are not a few, to stay with dishonour. The other ladies praised Pampinea's plan, and indeed were so prompt to follow it, that they had already began to discuss the manner in some detail as if they were forthwith to rise from their seats and take the road. When Philomena, whose judgment was excellent, interposed, saying, Ladies, though Pimpinea has spoken to most excellent effect, yet it were not well to be so precipitate as you seem disposed to be. Bethink that we are all women, nor is there any here so young, but she is of years to understand how women are minded towards one another. When they are alone together, and how ill they are able to rule themselves without the guidance of some man. We are sensitive, perverse, suspicious, pusillanimous, and timid, 
wherefore I much misdoubt, that if we find no other guidance than our own, this company is like to break up sooner, and with less credit to us than it should, against which it were well to provide at the outset. Said the Elisa, Without doubt man is woman's head, and without man's governance, it is seldom that aught that we do is brought to a commendable conclusion. But how are we to come by the men? Every one of us here knows that her kinsmen are of the most part dead, and that the survivors are dispersed, one here, one there, we know not where, bent each on escaping the same fate as ourselves. Nor were it seemly to seek the aid of strangers, for as we are in quest of health, we must find some means so to order matters that, wherever we seek diversion or repose, trouble and scandal do not follow us. While the ladies were thus conversing, there came into the church three young men, young, I say, but not so young, that the age of the youngest was less than twenty-five years, in whom neither the sinister course of events, nor the loss of friends or kinsfolk, nor fear for their own safety, had availed to quench, or even temper, the ardor of their love. The first was called Pamphilo, the second Philostrato, and the third Dioneo. Very debonair and chivalrous were they all, and in this troublous time they were seeking, if haply, to their exceeding great solace, they might have sight of their fair friends, all three of whom chanced to be among the said seven ladies, besides some that were of kin to the young men. At one and the same moment they recognized the ladies and were recognized by them, wherefore with a gracious smile Pompinea thus began. Lo! Fortune is propitious to our enterprise, having vouchsafed us the good offices of these young men, who are as gallant as they are discreet, and will gladly give us their guidance and escort, so we but take them into our service. Whereupon, Neifila, crimson from brow to neck with the blush of modesty, being one of those that had a lover among the young men, said, For God's sake, Pampinea, have a care what you say. Well assured am I, that naught but good can be said of any of them, and I deem that fit for office far more onerous than this which you propose for them, and their good and honourable company worthy of ladies fairer by far, and more tenderly to be cherished than such as we. But it's no secret that they love some of us here, wherefore I misdoubt that, if we take them with us, we may thereby give occasion for scandal, and censure merited neither by us nor by them. That, said Philomena, is of no consequence. So I but live honestly, my conscience gives me no disquietude, if others asperse me. God and the truth will take arms in my defence. Now, should they be disposed to attend us, of a truth we might say with Pompinea, that fortune favours our enterprise. The silence which followed betokened consent on the part of the other ladies, who then with one accord resolved, to call the young men, and acquaint them with their purpose, and pray them to be of their company. So without further parley, Pampinea, who had a kinsman among the young men, rose and approached them where they stood, intently regarding them. And greeting them gaily, she opened to them their plan, and besought them on the part of herself and her friends, to join their company, on terms of honourable and fraternal comradeship. At first the young men thought she did but trifle with them, but when they saw that she was in earnest, they answered with alacrity that they were ready, and promptly, even before they left the church, set matters in train for their departure. So all things meet being first sent forward in due order to their intended place of sojourn, the ladies with some of their maids, and the three young men, each attended by a man's servant, sallied forth of the city on the morrow being Wednesday, about daybreak, and took the road, nor had they journeyed more than two short miles, when they arrived at their destination. The estate lay upon a little hill, some distance from the nearest highway, and embowered in shrubberies of diverse hues, and other greenery, afforded the eye a pleasant prospect. On the summit of the hill was a palace, with galleries, halls, and chambers, disposed around a fair and spacious court, each very fair in itself, and the goodlier to see for the gladsome pictures with which it was adorned, the whole set amidst meads and gardens, 
laid out with marvellous art, wells of the coolest water, and vaults of the finest wines, things more suited to dainty drinkers than to sober and honourable women. On their arrival, the company, to their no small delight, found their beds already made, the rooms well swept and garnished with flowers of every sort that the season could afford, and the floors carpeted with rushes. When they were seated, Dioneo, a gallant who had not his match for courtesy and wit, spoke thus, My ladies, tis not our forethought so much as your own mother wit that has guided us hither. How you mean to dispose of your cares, I know not. Mine I left behind me within the city gate, when I issued thence with you a brief while ago. Wherefore I pray you, either address yourselves to make merry, to laugh and sing with me, so far I mean as may consist with your dignity, or give me leave to hie me back to the stricken city, there to abide with my cares. To whom Leslie Pompinea replied, as if she too had cast off all her cares. Well sayest thou, Dioneo, excellently well, Gaily we mean to live, it was a refuge from sorrow, that there we sought. Nor had we other cause to hums hither. But as no anarchy can long endure, I, who initiated the deliberations of which this fair company is the fruit, do now, to the end that our joy may be lasting, deem it expedient, that there be one among us in chief authority, honoured and obeyed by us as our superior, whose exclusive care it shall be to devise how we may pass our time blithely, and that each in turn may prove the weight of the care, as well as enjoy the pleasure of sovereignty, and no distinction being made of sex, and why be felt by none by reason of exclusion from the office. I propose that the weight and honour be borne by each one for a day, and let the first to bear sway be chosen by us all, those that follow to be appointed towards the vesper hour by him or her, who shall have had the seigneury for that day. And let each holder of the seigneury be, for the time, sole arbiter of the place and manner in which we are to pass our time. Pompinea's speech was received with the utmost applause, and with one accord she was chosen queen for the first day. Whereupon Philomena heed her lightly to obey tree, having often heard of the great honour in which its leaves, and such as were deservedly crowned therewith, were worthy to be holden. And having gathered a few sprays, she made thereof a goodly wreath of honour, and set it on Pompinea's head, which wreath was thenceforth, while their company endured, the visible sign of the wearer's sway and sovereignty. No sooner was Queen Pompinea crowned, than she bade all be silent, she then caused summon to her presence the four maids, and the servants of the three young men, and all keeping silence said to them, That I may show you all at once how, while still giving place to better, our company may flourish and endure, as long as it shall pleasure us, with order meet and assured delight, and without reproach. I first of all constitute Dioneo's man, Parmeno, my seneschal, and entrust him with the care, and control of all our household, and all that belongs to the service of the hall. Pamphilo's man, Sirisco, I appoint treasurer and counsellor of our excurve, and be he ever answerable to Parmeno. While Parmeno and Sirisco are too busy about their duties to serve their masters, let Philostratos man, Tindaro, have charge of the chambers of all three. My maid, Misia, and Philomena's maid, Likiska, will keep in the kitchen, and with all due diligence, prepare such dishes as Parmeno shall bid them. Lauretta's maid, Chimera, and Fiametta's maid, Stratilia, we make answerable for the ladies' chambers, and wherever we may take up our quarters, let them see that all is spotless. And now we enjoin you, one and all alike, as you value our favour, that none of you go where you may, return whence you may, hear or see what you may, bring us any tidings but such as be cheerful. These orders thus succinctly given were received with universal approval, whereupon Pompineo rose and said gaily, Here are gardens, meads, and other places delightsome enough, where you may wander at will and take your pleasure, but on the stroke of tears 
let all be here to breakfast in the shade. Thus dismissed by their new queen, the gay company sauntered gently through the garden, the young men saying sweet things to the fair ladies, who wove fair garlands of diverse sorts of leaves, and sang love songs. Having thus spent the time allowed them by the queen, they returned to the house, where they found that Parmeno had entered on his office with zeal, for in a hall on the ground floor they saw tables covered with the whitest of clothes, and beakers that shone like silver, and sprays of broom scattered everywhere. So at the bidding of the queen they washed their hands, and all took their places as marshalled by Parmeno. Dishes daintily prepared were served, and the finest wines were at hand. The three serving men did their office noiselessly. In a word, all was fair and ordered in a seemly manner, whereby the spirits of the company rose, and they seasoned their viands with pleasant jests and sprightly sallies. Breakfast done, the tables were removed, and the queen bade fetch instruments of music, for all, ladies and young men alike, knew how to tread a measure, and some of them played and sang with great skill. So at her command, Dionevo, having taken a lute, and Fiometta a viol, they struck up a dance in sweet concert, and the servants being dismissed to their repast, the queen, attended by the other ladies and the two young men, led off a stately carol, which ended, they fell to singing ditties, dainty and gay. Thus they diverted themselves until the queen, deeming it time to retire to rest, dismissed them all for the night. So the three young men and the ladies withdrew to their several quarters, which were in different parts of the palace. There they found the beds well made, and abundance of flowers, as in the hall, and so they undressed, and went to bed. Shortly after noon the queen rose, and roused the rest of the ladies, as also the young men, averring that it was injurious to the health to sleep long in the daytime. They therefore hid them to a meadow, where the grass grew green and luxuriant, being nowhere scorched by the sun, and the light breeze gently fanned them. So at the queen's command they arranged themselves in a circle on the grass, and hearkened while she thus spoke. You mark that the sun is high, the heat intense, and the silence unbroken, save by the cicalas among the olive trees. It were therefore the hate of folly, to quit this spot at present. Here the air is cool, and the prospect fair, and here, observe, are dice and chess. Take, then, your pleasure as you may be severally minded. But if you take my advice, you will find pastime for the hot hours before us, not in play, in which the loser must needs be vexed, and neither the winner nor the onlooker much be better pleased, but in telling of stories, in which the invention of one may afford solace to all the company of his hearers. You will not each have told the story before the sun will be low, and the heat abated, so that we shall be able to go and severally take our pleasure, where it may seem best to each. Wherefore, if my proposal meet with your approval, for in this I am disposed to consult your pleasure, let us adopt it, if not divert yourselves as you best you may, until the vesper hour. The queen's proposal being approved by all, ladies and men alike, she added, So please you, then, I ordain, that for this first day we be free to discourse of such matters as most commend themselves to each in turn. She then addressed Pamphilo, who sat on her right hand, bidding him with a gracious air to lead off with one of his stories, and prompted the word of command, Pamphilo, while all listened intently, Thus began. End of introduction of the first day. The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio, translated by J. M. Rigg. Day one, the first story. Sir Chiapaletto cheats a holy friar by a false confession and dies, and having lived as a very bad man, is on his death reputed a saint, and called San Chiapelletto. A seemly thing it is, dearest ladies, that whatever we do, it be begun in the holy and awful name of him who was the maker of all. 
Wherefore, as it falls to me to lead the way in this your enterprise of storytelling, I intend to begin with one of his wondrous works, that by hearing thereof, our hopes in him, in whom is no change, may be established, and his name be by us forever lauded. Tis manifest that, as things temporal are all doomed to pass and perish, so, within and without, they abound with trouble and anguish and travail, and are subject to infinite perils. Nor, save for the especial grace of God, should we, whose being is bound up with, and forms part of theirs, have either the strength to endure, or the wisdom to combat their adverse influences. By which grace we are visited and penetrated, so we must believe, not by reason of any merit of our own, but solely out of the fullness of God's own goodness, and in answer to the prayers of those who, being mortal like ourselves, did faithfully observe his ordinances during their lives, and are now become blessed for ever with him in heaven. To whom, as to advocates taught by experience all that belongs to our frailty, we, not daring perchance, to present our petitions in the presence of so great a judge, make known our requests for such things as we deem expedient for us. And of his mercy, richly abounding to usward, we have further proof herein that no keenness of mortal vision, being able in any degree to penetrate the secret counsels of the divine mind, it sometimes perchance happens that in error of judgment, we make one our advocate before his majesty, who is banished from his presence in eternal exile, and yet he to whom nothing is hidden, having regard rather to the sincerity of our prayers than to our ignorance or the banishment of the intercessor, hears us no less than if the intercessor were in truth one of the blessed who enjoy the light of his countenance, which the story that I am about to relate may serve to make apparent apparent i mean according to the standard of the judgment of man not of god the story goes then that musciato franzesi a great and wealthy merchant being made a knight of france and being to attend charles sanstere brother of the king of france when he came into tuscany at the instance and with the support of pope boniface found his affairs as often happens to merchants to be much involved in diverse quarters, and neither easily nor suddenly to be adjusted. Wherefore he determined to place them in the hands of commissioners, and found no difficulty except as to certain credits given to some Burgundians, for the recovery of which he doubted whether he could come by a competent agent. For well he knew that the Burgundians were violent men, and ill-conditioned and faithless, nor could he call to mind any man so bad that he could with confidence oppose his guile to theirs. After long pondering the matter, he recollected one Sir Chaparello da Prado, who much frequented his house in Paris, who, being short of stature and very affected, the French who knew not the meaning of Chaparello, but supposed that it meant the same as Capello, that is, garland, in their vernacular, called him not Capello, but Chiappelletto, by reason of his diminutive size. And as Chiappelletto, he was known everywhere, whereas few people knew him as Chiaparello. Now Chiappelletto's manner of life was thus. He was by profession a notary, and his pride was to make false documents. He would have made them as often as he was asked and more readily without fee than another at a great price. Few, indeed, he made that were not false, and great was his shame when they were discovered. False witness he bore, solicited or unsolicited, with boundless delight, and as oaths were in those days had in very great respect in France, he, scrupling not to forswear himself, corruptly carried the day in every case in which he was summoned faithfully to attest the truth he took inordinate delight and bestirred himself with great zeal in fomenting ill-feeling enmities dissensions between friends kinsfolk and all other folk and the more calamitous were the consequences the better he was pleased 
set him on murder or any other foul crime, and he never hesitated, but went about it with alacrity. He had been known on more than one occasion to inflict wounds or death by preference with his own hands. He was a profuse blasphemer of God and his saints, and that on the most trifling occasions, being of all men the most irascible. He was never seen at church, held all the sacraments vile things, and derided them in language of horrible ribaldry. On the other hand, he resorted readily to the tavern and other places of ill repute, and frequented them. He was as fond of women as a dog is of the stick. In the use against nature, he had not his match among the most abandoned. He would have pilfered and stolen as a matter of conscience as a holy man would make an ablation. Most gluttonous he was, and inordinately fond of his cups, whereby he sometimes brought upon himself both shame and suffering. He was also a practiced gamester and thrower of false dice. But why enlarge so much upon him? Enough that he was, perhaps, the worst man that ever was born. The rank and power of Musciato Franzesi had long been this reprobate's mainstay, serving in many instances to secure him considerate treatment on the part of the private persons whom he frequently, and the court which he unremittingly, outraged. So Musciato, having bethought him of this Ser Caparello, with whose way of life he was very well acquainted, judged him to be the very sort of person to cope with the guile of the Burgundians. He therefore sent for him, and thus addressed him. Sir Chiapelletto, I am, as thou knowest, about to leave this place for good, and among those with whom I have to settle accounts are certain Burgundians, very wily knaves. Nor know I the man whom I could more fitly entrust with the recovery of my money than thyself. Wherefore, as thou hast nothing to do at present, if thou wilt undertake this business, I will procure thee the favour of the court, and give thee a reasonable part of what thou shalt recover. Sir Chiapoletto, being out of employment, and by no means in easy circumstances, and about to lose Musciato, so long his mainstay and support, without the least demur, for in truth he had hardly any choice, made his mind up, and answered that he was ready to go. So the bargain was struck. Armed with the power of attorney and the royal letters commendatory, Ser Chiapoletto took leave of Messer Musciato and hired him to Burgundy, where he was hardly known to a soul. He set about the business which had brought him thither, the recovery of the money, in a manner amicable and considerate, foreign to his nature, as if he were minded to reserve his severity to the last. While thus occupied, he was frequently at the house of two Florentine usurers, who treated him with great distinction out of regard for Messer Musciato, and there it so happened that he fell sick. Two brothers forthwith placed physicians and servants in attendance upon him, and omitted no means meet and apt for the restoration of his health. But all remedies proved unavailing, for being now old, and having led, as the physicians reported, a disorderly life, he went daily from bad to worse, like one stricken with a mortal disease. This greatly disconcerted the two brothers, and one day, hard by the room in which Sir Chiapoletto lay sick, they began to talk about him, saying one to the other, What shall we do with this man? We are hard bested indeed on his account. If we turn him out of the house, sick as he is, we shall not only incur grave censure, but shall evince a signal want of sense. For folk must know the welcome we gave him in the first instance, the solicitude with which we had him treated and tended since his illness, during which time he could not possibly do aught to displease us, and yet they would see him suddenly turned out of our house, sick unto death. On the other hand, he has been so bad a man that he is sure not to confess or receive any of the church's sacraments, and dying thus unconfessed, he will be denied burial in church, but will be cast out into some ditch like a dog. Nay, twill be all one if he do confess, for such and so horrible have been his crimes that no friar or priest 
either will or can absolve him and so dying without absolution he will still be cast out into the ditch in which case the folk of these parts who reprobate our trade as iniquitous and revile it all day long and would fain rob us will seize their opportunity and raise a tumult and make a raid upon our houses crying away with these lombard dogs whom the church excludes from her pale and will certainly strip us of our goods and perhaps take our lives also so that in any case we stand to lose if this man die ser ciapoletto who as we said lay close at hand while they thus spoke and whose hearing was sharpened as is often the case by his malady overheard all that they said about him so he called them to him and said to them i would not have you disquiet yourselves in regard of me or apprehend loss to befall you by my death i have heard what you have said of me and have no doubt that twould be as you say if matters took the course you anticipate but i am minded that it should be otherwise i have committed so many offences against god in the course of my life that one more in the hour of my death will make no difference whatever to the account so seek out and bring hither the worthiest and most holy friar you can find and leave me to settle your affairs and mine upon a sound and solid basis with which you may rest satisfied the two brothers had not much hope of the result but yet they went to a friary and asked for a holy and discreet man to hear the confession of a lombard that was sick in their house and returned with an aged man of just and holy life very learned in the scriptures and venerable and held in very great and especial reverence by all the citizens as soon as he had entered the room where ser ciapoletto was lying and had taken his place by his side he began gently to comfort him then he asked him how long it was since he was confessed whereto ser ciapoletto who had never been confessed answered father it is my constant practice to be confessed at least once a week and many a week i am confessed more often but true it is that since i have been sick now eight days i have made no confession so sore has been my affliction son said the friar thou hast well done and well for thee if so thou continue to do as thou dost confess so often i see that my labor of hearkening and questioning will be slight nay but master friar said sir ciapoletto say not so i have not confessed so often but that i would fain make a general confession of all my sins that i have committed so far as i can recall them from the day of my birth to the present time and therefore i pray you my good father to question me precisely in every particular just as if i had never been confessed and spare me not by reason of my sickness for i had far rather do despite to my flesh than sparing it risk the perdition of my soul which my saviour redeemed with his precious blood the holy man was mightily delighted with these words which seemed to him to betoken a soul in a state of grace he therefore signified to sir ciapoletto his high approval of this practice and then began by asking him whether he had ever sinned carnally with a woman whereto sir ciapoletto answered with a sigh my father i scruple to tell you the truth in this matter fearing lest i sin in vainglory nay but said the friar speak boldly none ever sinned by telling the truth either in confession or otherwise then said sir ciapoletto as you bid me speak boldly i will tell you the truth of this matter i am virgin even as when i issued from my mother's womb now god's blessing on thee said the friar well done and the greater is thy merit in that hadst thou so willed thou mightest have done otherwise far more readily than we who are under constraint of rule he then proceeded to ask whether he had offended god by gluttony whereto ser giapoletto heaving a heavy sigh answered that he had frequently so offended for being wont to fast not only in lent like other devout persons but at least three days in every week 
taking nothing but bread and water, he had quaffed the water with as good a gusto and as much enjoyment, more particularly when fatigued by devotion or pilgrimage, as great drinkers quaff their wine. And oftentimes he had felt a craving for such dainty dishes of herbs as ladies make when they go into the country. And now and again he had relished his food more than seemed to him meat in one who fasted, as he did, for devotion. Son, said the friar, these sins are natural and very trifling, and therefore I would not have thee burden thy conscience too much with them. There is no man, however holy he may be, but must sometimes find it pleasant to eat after a long fast, and to drink after exertion. Oh, my father, said Ser Chapoletto, say not this to comfort me. You well know that I know that the things which are done in the service of God ought to be done in perfect purity of an unsullied spirit, and whoever does otherwise sins. The friar, well content, replied, Glad I am that thou dost think so, and I am mightily pleased with thy pure and good conscience which therein appears. But tell me, hast thou sinned by avarice, coveting more than was reasonable, or withholding more than was right? My father, replied Ser Chapoletto, I would not have you disquiet yourself, because I am in the house of these usurers. No part have I in their concerns. Nay, I did not come here to admonish and reprehend them, and wean them from this abominable traffic. And so, I believe, I had done had not God sent me this visitation. But you must know that my father left me a fortune, of which I dedicated the greater part to God, and since then, for my own support and the relief of Christ's poor, I have done a little trading, whereof I had desired to make gain, and all that I have gotten I have shared with God's poor, reserving one half on my own needs and giving the other half to them. And so well has my Maker prospered me, that I have ever managed my affairs to better and better account. Well done, said the friar, but how hast thou often given way to anger? Often indeed, I assure you, said Ser Chiapoletto, and who could refrain therefrom, seeing men doing frowardly all day long, breaking the commandments of God, and wrecking naught of his judgments? Many a time in the course of a single day, I had rather be dead than alive, to see the young men going after vanity, swearing and forswearing themselves, haunting taverns, avoiding the churches, and in short, walking in the way of the world, rather than in God's way. My son, said the friar, this is a righteous wrath, nor could I find occasion therein to lay a penance upon thee. But did anger ever by any chance betray thee into taking human life, or affronting or otherwise wronging any? Alas, replied Sir Chapletto, alas, sir, man of God, though you seem to be, how come you to speak after this manner? If I had had so much as the least thought of doing any of the things of which you speak, should I believe, think you, that I had been thus supported of God? These are the deeds of robbers and such like evil men, to whom I have ever said, when any I saw, Go, God, change your heart said then the friar now my son as thou hopest to be blessed of god tell me hast thou never borne false witness against any or spoken evil of another or taken the goods of another without his leave yes master friar answered ser chiapoletto most true it is that i have spoken evil of another for i once had a neighbor who without the least excuse in the world was ever beating his wife and so great was my pity of the poor creature, whom, when he was in his cups, he would thrash as God alone knows how. Once I spoke evil of him to his wife's kinsfolk. Well, well, said the friar, thou tellest me thou hast been a merchant, hast thou ever cheated any, as merchants used to do? If faith, yes, master friar, said Sir Chiapoletto, but I know not who he was only that he brought me some money which he owed me for some cloth that I had sold him, and I put it in a box without counting it, where a month afterwards I found four farthings more than there should have been, which I kept for a year to return to him, 
but not seeing him again, I bestowed them in alms for the love of God. This, said the friar, was a small matter, and thou didst well to bestow them as thou didst. The holy friar went on to ask him many other questions, to which he made answer in each case in this sort. Then, as the friar was about to give him absolution, Sir Chiapoletto interposed. Sir, I have yet a sin to confess. What? asked the friar. I remember, he said, that I once caused my servant to sweep my house on a Saturday afternoon, and that my observance of Sunday was less devout than it should have been. Oh, my son, said the friar, this is a light matter. No, said Sir Chiapoletto, say not a light matter, for Sunday is the more to be had in honor, because on that day our Lord rose from the dead. Then said the holy friar, Now is there aught else that thou hast done? Yes, Master Friar, replied Sir Chiapoletto, once by inadvertence I spat in the church of God. At this the friar began to smile, and said, my son, this is not a matter to trouble about. We who are religious spit there all day long, and great impiety it is when you so do, replied Sir Chapeletto, for there is nothing that is so worthy to be kept from all impurity as the holy temple in which sacrifice is offered to God. More, he said, in the same strain, which I pass over. And then at last he began to sigh and by and by to weep bitterly, as he was well able to do when he chose. And the friar demanding, My son, why weepest thou? Alas, Master Friar, answered Ser Chiapoletto, a sin yet remains, which I have never confessed. Such shame were it to me to tell it. And as often as I call it to mind, I weep as you now see me weep being well assured that God will never forgive me this sin. Then said the holy friar, Come, come, my son, what is this that thou sayest? If all the sins of all the men that ever were or ever shall be, as long as the world shall endure, were concentrated in one man, so great is the goodness of God that he would freely pardon them all, were he but penitent and contrite, as I see thou art, and confess them. Wherefore tell me thy sin with a good courage. Then said Sir Chiapoletto, still weeping bitterly, Alas, my father, mine is too great a sin, and scarce can I believe, if your prayers do not cooperate, that God will ever grant me his pardon thereof. Tell it with a good courage, said the friar. I promise thee to pray God for thee. Ser Chiapoletto, however, continued to weep, and would not speak, for all the friar's encouragement. When he had kept him for a good while in suspense, he heaved a mighty sigh, and said, My father, as you promised me to pray God for me, I will tell it you. Know then, that once, when I was a little child, I cursed my mother. And having so said, he began again to weep bitterly. O oh, my son, said the friar, does this seem to thee so great a sin? Men curse God all day long, and he pardons them freely, if they repent them of having so done. And thinkest thou he will not pardon thee this? Weep not, be comforted, for truly hadst thou been one of them that set him on the cross with the contrition that I see in thee, Thou wouldst not fail of his pardon. Alas, my father, rejoined Ser Chapoletto, what is this you say? To curse my sweet mother that carried me in her womb for nine months, day and night, and afterwards on her shoulder more than a hundred times? Heinous indeed was my offence. Tis too great a sin, nor will it be pardoned unless you pray God for me. The friar, now perceiving that Ser Chiapoletto had nothing more to say, gave him absolution and his blessing, reputing him for a most holy man, fully believing that all that he had said was true. And who would not have so believed, hearing him so speak at the point of death? 
Then, when all was done, he said, Ser Chiapoletto, if God so will, you will soon be well. But should it so come to pass that God call your blessed soul to himself in this state of grace, is it well pleasing to you that your body be buried in our convent? Yea, verily, Master Fryer, replied Ser Chiapoletto, there would I be, and nowhere else, since you have promised to pray God for me, besides which I have ever had a special devotion to your order. Wherefore I pray you that on your return to your convent you cause to be sent me that very blood of Christ which you consecrate in the morning on the altar, because, unworthy though I be, I purpose with your leave to take it, and afterwards the holy and extreme unction that, though I have lived as a sinner, I may die at any rate as a Christian. The holy man said that he was greatly delighted, that it was well said of Sir Chiapoletto, and that he would cause the host to be forthwith brought to him. And so it was. The two brothers, who much misdoubted Sir Chiapoletto's power to deceive the friar, had taken their stand on the other side of a wooden partition which divided the room in which Sir Chapletto lay from another, and hearkening there, they readily heard and understood what Sir Chapletto said to the friar, and at times could scarce refrain their laughter as they followed his confession. And now and again they said to one another, What manner of man is this, whom neither age nor sickness nor fear of death on the threshold of which he now stands, nor yet of God, before whose judgment seat he must soon appear, has been able to turn from his wicked ways that he die not even as he has lived. But seeing that his confession had secured the interment of his body in church, they troubled themselves no further. Ser Chiapoletto soon afterwards communicated, and growing immensely worse, received the extreme unction and died shortly after Vespers on the same day on which he had made his good confession. So the two brothers, having from his own monies provided the wherewith to procure him an honourable sepulchre, and sent word to the friars to come at even, to observe the usual vigil, and in the morning to fetch the corpse, set all things in order accordingly. The holy friar who had confessed him, hearing that he was dead, had audience of the prior of the friary. A chapter was convened, and the assembled brothers heard from the confessor's own mouth how Ser Chiapoletto had been a holy man, as had appeared by his confession, and were exhorted to receive the body with the utmost veneration and pious care, as one by which there was good hope that God would work many miracles. To this the prior and the rest of the credulous co-fraternity assenting, they went in a body in the evening to the place where the corpse of Ser Chiapoletto lay, and kept a great and solemn vigil over it, and in the morning they made a procession habited in their surplices and copes, with books in their hands and crosses in front, and chanting as they went, they fetched the corpse and brought it back to their church with the utmost pomp and solemnity, being followed by almost all the folk of the city, men and women alike. So it was laid in the church, and then the holy friar, who had heard the confession, got up in the pulpit and began to preach marvelous things of Sir Chiapoletto's life, his fasts, his virginity, his simplicity, and guilelessness and holiness, narrating, among other matters, that of which Sir Chiapoletto had made tearful confession as his greatest sin, and how he had hardly been able to make him conceive that God would pardon him from which he took occasion to reprove his hearers, saying, And you, accursed of God, on the least pretext, blaspheme God and his mother and all the celestial court. And much beside he told of his loyalty and purity, and in short, so wrought upon the people by his words, to which they gave entire credence, that they all conceived a great veneration for Ser Chapoletto, and at the close of the office came pressing forward with the utmost vehemence to kiss the feet and the hands of the corpse, from which they tore off all the cerements, each thinking himself blessed to have but a scrap thereof in his possession. And so it was arranged, 
that it should be kept there all day long, so as to be visible and accessible to all. At nightfall it was honourably interred in a marble tomb in one of the chapels, where on the morrow, one by one, folk came and lit tapers and prayed and paid their vows, setting there the waxen images which they had dedicated. And the fame of Chiapoletto's holiness and the devotion to him grew in such measure that scarce any there was that in any adversity would vow aught to any saint but he and they called him and still call him san chapaletto affirming that many miracles have been and daily are wrought by god through him for such as devoutly crave his intercession so lived so died ser ceparello da prato and came to be reputed a saint as you have heard nor would i deny that it is possible that he is the number of the blessed in the presence of god seeing that though his life was evil and depraved yet he might in his last moments have made so complete an act of contrition that perchance god had mercy on him and received him into his kingdom but as this is hidden from us i speak according to that which appears and i say that he ought rather to be in the hands of the devil in hell than in paradise which if so it be is a manifest token of the superabundance of the goodness of god to usward inasmuch as he regards not our error but the sincerity of our faith and hearkens unto us when mistaking one who is at enmity with him for a friend we have recourse to him as to one holy indeed as our intercessor for his grace wherefore that we of this gay company may by his grace be preserved safe and sound throughout this time of adversity commend we ourselves in our need to him whose name we began by invoking with lauds and reverent devotion and good confidence that we shall be heard end of day one the first story Day One, the Second Story. Abraham, a Jew, at the instance of Jeanneau de Chevigny, goes to the court of Rome, and having marked the evil life of the clergy, returns to Paris and becomes a Christian. Pamphilo's story elicited the mirth of some of the ladies, and the hearty commendation of all, who listened to it with close attention until the end. Whereupon the queen bade Neyphile, who sat next her, to tell a story, that the commencement thus made of their diversions might have its sequel. Neyphile, whose graces of mind matched the beauty of her person, consented with a gladsome goodwill, and thus began. Pamphilo had shown by his story that the goodness of God spares to regard our errors when they result from unavoidable ignorance, and in mine I mean to show you how the same goodness bearing patiently with the shortcomings of those who should be its faithful witness in deed and word, draws from them contrariwise evidence of his infallible truth, to the end that what we believe we may with more assured conviction follow. In Paris, gracious ladies, as I have heard tell, there was once a great merchant, a large dealer in drapery, a good man, most loyal and righteous, his name Jeanneau de Chevigny, between whom and a Jew, Abraham by name, also a merchant and a man of great wealth, as also most loyal and righteous, there subsisted a very close friendship. Now Jeanneau, observing Abraham's loyalty and rectitude, began to be sorely vexed in spirit that the soul of one so worthy and wise and good should perish for want of faith. Wherefore he began in a friendly manner to plead with him that he should leave the errors of the Jewish faith and turn to the Christian verity, which, being sound and holy, he might see daily prospering and gaining ground, whereas on the contrary his own religion was dwindling and was almost come to nothing. The Jew replied that he believed that there was no faith sound and holy except the Jewish faith in which he was born and in which he meant to live and die. Nor would anything ever turn him therefrom. Nothing daunted, however, 
Giano, some days afterwards, began again to ply Abraham with similar arguments, explaining to him in such crude fashion as merchants use the reasons why our faith is better than the Jewish. And though the Jew was a great master in the Jewish law, yet, whether it was by reason of his friendship for Giano, or that the Holy Spirit dictated the words that the simple merchant used, at any rate the Jew began to be much interested in Giano's arguments, though still too staunch in his faith to suffer himself to be converted. But Giano was no less assiduous in plying him with argument than he was obstinate in adhering to his law, insomuch that at length the Jew, overcome by such incessant appeals, said, "'Well, well, Giano, thou wouldst have me become a Christian, and I am disposed to do so, provided I first go to Rome, and there see him whom thou callest God's vicar on earth, and observe what manner of life he leads, and his brother cardinals with him. And if such it be that thereby, in conjunction with thy words, I may understand that thy faith is better than mine, as thou hast sought to show me, I will do as I have said. Otherwise I will remain as I am, a Jew. When Gianno heard this, he was greatly distressed, saying to himself, I thought to have converted him, but now I see that the pains which I took for so excellent a purpose are all in vain, for if he goes to the court of Rome, and sees the iniquitous and foul life which the clergy lead there, so far from turning Christian, had he been converted already, he would without doubt relapse into Judaism. Then turning to Abraham, he said, Nay, but my friend, why wouldst thou be at all this labour and great expense of travelling from here to Rome? To say nothing of the risks, both by sea and by land, which a rich man like thee must needs run. Thinkest thou not to find here one that can give thee baptism? And as for any doubts that thou mayst have, touching the faith to which I point thee, where wilt thou find greater masters and sages therein than here, to resolve thee of any question thou mayst put to them? Wherefore, in my opinion, this journey of thine is superfluous. Think that the prelates there are such as thou mayst have seen here, nay, as much better as they are nearer to the chief pastor, and so, by my advice, thou wilt spare thy pains until some time of indulgence, when I, perhaps, may be able to bear thee company. The Jew replied, Gianno, I doubt not that so it is as thou sayest, but once and for all I tell thee that I am minded to go there, and will never otherwise do that which thou wouldst have me, and hast so earnestly besought me to do. Go then, said Gianno, seeing that his mind was made up, and good luck go with thee. And so he gave up the contest, because nothing would be lost, though he felt sure that he would never become a Christian after seeing the court of Rome. The Jew took horse, and posted with all possible speed to Rome, where on his arrival he was honourably received by his fellow Jews. He said nothing to any one of the purpose for which he had come but began circumspectly to acquaint himself with the ways of the Pope and the Cardinals and the other prelates and all the courtiers. And from what he saw for himself, being a man of great intelligence, or learned from others, he discovered that, without distinction of rank, they were all sunk in the most disgraceful lewdness, sinning not only in the way of nature, but after the manner of the men of Sodom, without any restraint of remorse or shame, in such sort that, when any great favour was to be procured, the influence of the courtesans and boys was of no small moment. Moreover, he found them one and all gluttonous, wine-bibbers, drunkards, and next after lewdness, most addicted to the shameless service of the belly, like brute beasts. And as he probed the matter still further, he perceived that they were all so greedy and avaricious that human, nay, Christian blood, and things sacred of what kind soever, spiritualities no less than temporalities, they bought and sold for money, which traffic was greater 
and employed more brokers than the drapery trade and all the other trades of Paris put together, open simony and gluttonous success being glozed under such specious terms as arrangement and moderate use of creature comforts, as if God could not penetrate the thoughts of even the most corrupt hearts, to say nothing of the signification of words, and would suffer himself to be misled after the manner of men by the names of things. Which matters, with many others which are not to be mentioned, our modest and sober-minded Jew found by no means to his liking, so that, his curiosity being fully satisfied, he was minded to return to Paris, which accordingly he did. There, on his arrival, he was met by Gianno, and the two made great cheer together. Gianno expected Abraham's conversion least of all things, and allowed him some days of rest before he asked what he thought of the Holy Father, and the cardinals, and the other courtiers. To which the Jew forthwith replied, I think God owes them all an evil recompense. I tell thee, so far as I was able to carry my investigations, holiness, devotion, good works, or exemplary living in any kind was nowhere to be found in any clerk, but only lewdness, avarice, gluttony, and the like, and worse, if worse may be, appeared to be held in such honour of all, that, to my thinking, the place is a centre of diabolical, rather than of divine activities. To the best of my judgment, your pastor, and by consequence all that are about him, devote all their zeal and ingenuity and subtlety to devise how best and most speedily they may bring the Christian religion to naught, and banish it from the world. And because I see that what they so zealously endeavour does not come to pass, but that, on the contrary, your religion continually grows, and shines more and more clear, therein I seem to discern a very evident token that it, rather than any other, as being more true and holy than any other, has the Holy Spirit for its foundation and support. For which cause, whereas I met your exhortations in a harsh and obdurate temper, and would not become a Christian, now I frankly tell you that I would on no account omit to become such. Go we then to the church, and there, according to the traditional rite of your holy faith, let me receive baptism. Gianno, who had anticipated a diametrically opposite conclusion, as soon as he heard him so speak, was the best pleased man that ever was in the world. So taking Abraham with him to Notre Dame, he prayed the clergy there to baptise him. When they heard that it was his own wish, they forthwith did so, and Gianno raised him from the sacred font, and named him Jean. And afterwards he caused teachers of great eminence thoroughly to instruct him in our faith, which he readily learned, and afterwards practised in a good, a virtuous, nay, a holy life. End of day one, the second story. Day one, the third story. Melchizedek, a Jew, by a story of three rings, averts a great danger with which he was menaced by Saladin. When Nephili had brought her story to a close, amid the commendations of all the company, Philomena, at the queen's behest, thus began. The story told by Nephili brings to my mind another in which also a Jew appears, but this time as the hero of a perilous adventure, and as enough has been said of God and of the truth of our faith, it will not now be inopportune if we descend to mundane events and the actions of men. Wherefore, I propose to tell you a story, which will perhaps dispose you to be more circumspect than you have been wont to be in answering questions addressed to you, well you know, or should know, loving gossips, that, as it often happens, that folk by their own folly forfeit a happy estate, and are plunged in most grievous misery, so good sense will extricate the wise from extremity of peril, and establish them in complete and assured peace. Of the change from good to evil fortune, which folly may effect, instances abound, indeed, occurring as they do by the thousand day by day, they are so conspicuous, 
that their recital would be beside our present purpose. But that good sense may be our succor in misfortune, I will now, as I promised, make plain to you within the narrow compass of a little story. Saladin, who by his great valor had from small beginnings made himself sultan of Egypt, and gained many victories over kings both Christian and Saracen, having in diverse wars and by diverse lavish displays of magnificence spent all his treasure, and in order to meet a certain emergency, being in need of a large sum of money, and being at a loss to raise it with a celerity adequate to his necessity, bethought him of a wealthy Jew, Melchizedek by name, who lent at Usance in Alexandria, and who, were he but willing, was, as he believed, able to accommodate him, but was so miserly that he would never do so of his own accord, nor was Saladin disposed to constrain him thereto. So great, however, was his necessity, that after pondering every method whereby the Jew might be induced to be compliant, at last he determined to devise a colorably reasonable pretext for extorting the money from him. So he sent for him, received him affably, seated him by his side, and presently said to him, My good man, I have heard from many people that thou art very wise, and of great discernment in divine things. Wherefore, I would gladly know of thee, which of the three laws thou reputest the true law, the law of the Jews, the law of the Saracens, or the law of the Christians? The Jew, who was indeed a wise man, saw plainly enough that Saladin meant to entangle him in his speech, that he might have occasion to harass him, and bethought him that he could not praise any of the three laws above another without furnishing Saladin with the pretext which he sought. So, concentrating all the force of his mind to shape such an answer as might avoid the snare, he presently lit on what he thought, saying, My lord, a pretty question indeed is this which you propound, and fain would I answer it, to which end it is opposite that I tell you a story, which, if you will hearken, is as follows. If I mistake not, I remember to have often heard tell of a great and rich man of old time, who, among other most precious jewels, had in his treasury a ring of extraordinary beauty and value, which by reason of its value and beauty he was minded to leave to his heirs for ever, for which cause he ordained that whichever of his sons was found in possession of the ring, as by his bequest, should thereby be designate his heir, and be entitled to receive from the rest the honour and homage due to a superior. The son, to whom he bequeathed the ring, left it in like manner to his descendant, making the like ordinance as his predecessor. In short, the ring passed from hand to hand for many generations, and in the end came to the hands of one who had three sons, goodly and virtuous all, and very obedient to their father, so that he loved them all indifferently. The rule touching the descent of the ring was known to the young men, and each aspiring to hold the place of honor among them, did all he could to persuade his father, who was now old, to leave the ring to him at his death. The worthy man, who loved them all equally, and knew not how to choose from among them, a sole legatee, promised the ring to each in turn, and in order to satisfy all three, caused a cunning artificer secretly to make other two rings, so like the first, that the maker himself could hardly tell which was the true ring. So before he died, he disposed of the rings, giving one privately to each of his sons, whereby it came to pass that after his decease each of the sons claimed the inheritance and the place of honor, and his claim being disputed by his brothers produced his ring in witness of right, and the rings being found so like one to another that it was impossible to distinguish the true one. The suit to determine the true heir remained pendant, and still so remains. And so, my lord, to your question, touching the three laws given to the three peoples by God the Father, 
I answer, each of these peoples deems itself to have the true inheritance, the true law, the true commandments of God. But which of them is justified in so believing is a question which, like that of the rings, remains pendant. The excellent adroitness with which the Jew had contrived to evade the snare which he had laid for his feet was not lost upon Saladin. He therefore determined to let the Jew know his need, and did so, telling him at the same time what he had intended to do, in the event of his answering less circumspectly than he had done. Thereupon the Jew gave the Soldan all the accommodation that he required, which the Soldan afterwards repaid him in full. He also gave him most magnificent gifts, with his lifelong amity, and a great and honorable position near his person. End of Day One, The Third Story Day One, The Fourth Story A monk lapses into a sin meriting the most severe punishment, justly censures the same fault in his abbot, and thus evades the penalty. The silence which followed the conclusion of Philomena's tale was broken by Dioneo, who sat next her, and without waiting for the queen's word, for he knew that by the rule laid down at the commencement it was now his turn to speak, began on this wise. Loving ladies, if I have well understood the intention of you all, we are here to afford entertainment to one another by story-telling. Wherefore, providing only naught is done that is repugnant to this end, I deem it lawful for each, and so said our queen a little while ago, to tell whatever story seems to him most likely to be amusing. Seeing, then, that we have heard how Abraham saved his soul by the good counsel of Yechamo de Chevigny, and Melcedich by his own good sense safeguarded his wealth against the stratagems of Saladin, I hope to escape your censure in narrating a brief story of a monk, who, by his address, delivered his body from imminent peril of most severe chastisement. In the not very remote district of Lodignana, there flourished formerly a community of monks more numerous and holy than there is there to be found to-day, among whom was a young brother, whose vigour and lustihood neither the fasts nor the vigils availed to subdue. One afternoon, while the rest of the confraternity slept, our young monk took a stroll around the church, which lay in a very sequestered spot and chanced to espy a young and very beautiful girl, a daughter, perhaps, of one of the husbandmen of those parts, going through the fields and gathering herbs as she went. No sooner had he seen her than he was sharply assailed by carnal concuspicence, insomuch that he made up to and accosted her, and she, hearkening, little by little, they came to an understanding, and unobserved by any, entered his cell together. Now it so chanced that, while they fooled it within somewhat recklessly, he being overwrought with passion, the abbot awoke, and passing slowly by the young monk's cell, heard the noise which they made within, and, the better to distinguish the voices, came softly up to the door of the cell, and, listening, discovered that beyond all doubt there was a woman within. His first thought was to force the door open, but— Changing his mind, he returned to his chamber, and waited until the monk should come out. Delightsome beyond measure, though the young monk found his intercourse with the girl, yet was he not altogether without anxiety. He had heard, as he thought, the sound of footsteps in the dormitory, and having applied his eye to a convenient aperture, had had a good view of the abbot as he stood by the door listening. He was thus fully aware that the abbot might have detected the presence of a woman in the cell, whereat he was exceedingly distressed, knowing that he had a severe punishment to expect. But he concealed his vexation from the girl, while he busily cast about in his mind for some way of escape from his embarrassment. He thus hit on a novel stratagem, which was exactly suited to his purpose. With the air of one who had had enough of the girl's company, he said to her, "'I shall now leave you, in order that I may arrange for your departure hence unobserved. Stay here quietly until I return.' So out he went, locking the door of the cell, 
and withdrawing the key, which he carried straight to the abbot's chamber, and handed to him, as was the custom when a monk was going out, saying, with a composed air, "'Sir, I was not able this morning to bring in all the faggots which I had made ready, so with your leave I will go to the wood and bring them in.' The abbot, desiring to have better cognizance of the monk's offence, and not dreaming that the monk knew that he had been detected, was pleased with the turn matters had taken, and received the key gladly, at the same time giving the monk the desired leave. So the monk withdrew, and the abbot began to consider what course it were best for him to take, whether to assemble the brotherhood and open the door in their presence, that, being witnesses of the delinquency, they might have no cause to murmur against him when he proceeded to punish the delinquent, or whether it were not better first to learn from the girl's own lips how it had come about, and, reflecting that she might be the wife or daughter of some man who would take it ill that she should be shamed by being exposed to the gaze of all the monks, he determined first of all to find out who she was, and then to make up his mind. So he went softly to the cell, opened the door, and, having entered, closed it behind him. The girl, seeing that her visitor was none other than the abbot, quite lost her presence of mind, and, quaking with shame, began to weep. Master Abbot surveyed her from head to foot, and, seeing that she was fresh and comely, fell a prey, old though he was, to fleshly cravings no less poignant and sudden than those which the young monk had experienced, and began thus to commune with himself, "'Alas! why take I not my pleasure when I may, seeing that I never lack for occasions of trouble and vexation of spirit?' and here is a fair wench, and no one in the world to know. If I can bring her to pleasure me, I know not why I should not do so. Who will know? No one will ever know. And sin that is hidden is half forgiven. This chance may never come again. So, methinks, it were the part of wisdom to take the boon which God bestows. So musing, with an altogether different purpose from that with which he had come, he drew near the girl, and softly bade her to be comforted, and besought her not to weep. And so, little by little, he came at last to show her what he would be at. The girl, being made neither of iron nor of adamant, was readily induced to gratify the abbot, who, after bestowing upon her many an embrace and kiss, got upon the monk's bed, where, being sensible perhaps of the disparity between his reverend portliness and her tender youth, and fearing to injure her by his excessive weight, he refrained from lying upon her, but laid her upon him, and in that manner disported himself with her for a long time. The monk, who had only pretended to go to the wood, and had concealed himself in the dormitory, no sooner saw the abbot enter his cell than he was overjoyed to think that his plan would succeed and when he saw that he had locked the door, he was well assured thereof. So he stole out of his hiding-place, and set his eye to an aperture through which he saw and heard all that the abbot did and said. At length the abbot, having had enough of dalliance with the girl, locked her in the cell and returned to his chamber. Catching sight of the monk soon afterwards, and supposing him to have returned from the wood, he determined to give him a sharp reprimand, and to have him imprisoned, that he might thus secure the prey for himself alone. He therefore caused him to be summoned, chid him very severely, and with a stern countenance, and ordered him to be put in prison. The monk replied trippingly, "'Sir, I have not been so long in the order of St. Benedict as to have every particular of the rule by heart.' nor did you teach me before to-day in what posture it behoves the monk to have intercourse with women, but limited your instruction to such matters as fasts and vigils. As, however, you have now given me my lesson, I promise you, if you also pardon my offence, that I will never repeat it, but will always follow the example which you have set me. The abbot who was a shrewd man, saw at once that the monk was not only more knowing than he, but had actually seen what he had done. Nor, conscience-stricken himself, could he for shame mete out to the monk a measure of what he himself merited. So, pardon given, with an injunction to bury what had been seen in silence, 
they decently conveyed the young girl out of the monastery. Whither, it is to be believed, they now and again caused her to return. End of Day One The Fourth Story Day One The Fifth Story The Marchioness of Monferrato, by a banquet of hens seasoned with wit, checks the mad passion of the King of France. The story told by Dioneo evoked at first some qualms of shame in the minds of the ladies, as was apparent by the modest blush that tinged their faces. Then exchanging glances, and scarce able to refrain their mirth, they listened to it with half-suppressed smiles. On its conclusion they bestowed upon Dioneo a few words of gentle reprehension, with intent to admonish him that such stories were not to be told among ladies. The queen then turned to Fiametta, who was seated on the grass at her side, and bade her follow suit, and Fiametta, with a gay and gracious mien, thus began. The line upon which our story-telling proceeds, to wit, to show the virtue that resides in apt and ready repartees, pleases me well, and as in affairs of love, men and women are in diverse case, for to aspire to the love of a woman of higher lineage than his own is wisdom in man, whereas a woman's good sense is then most conspicuous when she knows how to preserve herself from becoming enamoured of a man, her superior in rank. I am minded, fair my ladies, to show you by the story which I am now to tell, how by deed and word a gentlewoman both defended herself against attack and weaned her suitor from his love. The Marquis of Monferrato, a paladin of distinguished prowess, was gone overseas as Gonfalonier of the Church in a general array of the Christian forces whose merits being canvassed as the court of Philippe de Borgne, in the eve of his departure from France on the same service, a knight observed that there was not under the stars a couple comparable to the Marquis and his lady, in that while the Marquis was a paragon of the knightly virtues, his lady for beauty and honour was without a peer among all the other ladies of the world. These words made so deep an impression on the mind of the King of France, that, though he had never seen the lady, he fell ardently in love with her, and being to join the Armada, resolved that his port of embarkation should be no other than Genoa, in order that, travelling thither by land, he might find a decent pretext for visiting the Marchioness, with whom, in the absence of the Marquis, he trusted to have the success which he desired. Nor did he fail to put his design in execution." Having sent his many army on before, he took the road himself with a small company of gentlemen, and as they approached the territory of the Marquis, he dispatched a courier to the Marchioness a day in advance, to let her know that he expected to breakfast with her the next morning. The lady, who knew her part and played it well, replied graciously that he would be indeed welcome, and that his presence would be the greatest of all favours. She then began to commune with herself what this might import, that so great a king should come to visit her in her husband's absence, nor was she so deluded as not to surmise that it was the fame of her beauty that drew him thither. Nevertheless she made ready to do him honour in a manner befitting her high degree, summoning to her presence such of the retainers as remained in the castle, and giving all needful directions with their advice, except that the order of the banquet and the choice of the dishes she reserved entirely to herself. Then, having caused all the hens that could be found in the countryside to be brought with all speed into the castle, she bade her cooks furnish forth the royal table with diverse dishes made exclusively of such fare. The king arrived on the appointed day, and was received by the lady with great and ceremonious cheer. Fair and noble and gracious seemed she in the eyes of the king, beyond all that he had conceived from the knight's words, so that he was lost in admiration, and inly extolled her to the skies, his passion being the more inflamed in proportion, as he found the lady surpassed the idea which he had formed of her. A suite of rooms furnished with all the appointments befitting the reception of so great a king, 
was placed at his disposal, and after a little rest, breakfast time being come, he and the marchioness took their places at the same table, while his suite were honourably entertained at other boards according to their several qualities. Many courses were served with no lack of excellent and rare wines, whereby the king was mightily pleased, as also by the extraordinary beauty of the marchioness, on whom his eye from time to time rested. However, as course followed course, the king observed with some surprise that, though the dishes were diverse, yet they were all but variations of one and the same fare, to wit, the pullet. Besides which he knew that the domain was one which could not but afford plenty of diverse sorts of game, and by forewarning the lady of his approach, he had allowed time for hunting. Yet, for all his surprise, he would not broach the question more directly with her than by a reference to her hens. So, turning to her with a smile, he said, Madam, do hens grow in this country without so much as a single cock? The marchioness, who perfectly apprehended the drift of the question, saw in it an opportunity, sent her by God, of evincing her virtuous resolution. So, casting a haughty glance upon the king, she answered thus, Sire, no, but the women, though they may differ somewhat from others in dress and rank, are yet of the same nature here as elsewhere. The significance of the banquet of pullets was made manifest to the king by these words, as also the virtue which they veiled. He perceived that on a lady of such a temper words would be wasted, and that force was out of the question. Wherefore, yielding to the dictates of prudence and honour, he was now as prompt to quench, as he had been inconsiderate in conceiving, his unfortunate passion for the lady, and fearing her answers, he refrained from further jesting with her, and, dismissing his hopes, devoted himself to his breakfast, which done, he disarmed suspicion of the dishonourable purpose of his visit by an early departure, and thanking her for the honour she had conferred upon him, and commending her to God, took the road to Genoa. End of day one. The fifth story. Day one. The sixth story. A worthy man, by an apt saying, puts to shame the wicked hypocrisy of the religious. When all had commended the virtue of the marchioness and the spirited reproof which she administered to the king of France, Emilia, who sate next to Fiametta, obeyed the queen's behest, and with a good courage thus begun. My story is also of a reproof, but of one administered by a worthy man who lived the secular life to a greedy religious, by a jibe as merry as admirable. Know then, dear ladies, that there was in our city not long ago a friar minor, an inquisitor in matters of heresy, who, albeit he strove might and main to pass himself off as a holy man, and tenderly solicitous for the integrity of the Christian faith, as they all do, yet he had as keen a scent for a full purse as for a deficiency of faith. Now it so chanced that his zeal was rewarded by the discovery of a good man far better furnished with money than with sense, who in an unguarded moment, not from defect of faith, but rather, perhaps, from excess of hilarity, being heated with wine, had happened to say to his boon companions that he had a wine good enough for Christ himself to drink which, being reported to the Inquisitor, he, knowing the man to be possessed of large estates and a well-lined purse, set to work in hot haste, cum gladies et fustibus, to bring all the rigour of the law to bear upon him, designing thereby not to lighten the load of his victim's misbelief, but to increase the weight of his own purse by the florins which he might, as he did, receive from him. So he cited him to his presence, and asked him whether what was alleged against him were true. The good man answered in the affirmative, and told him how it had happened. Then, said our most holy and devout inquisitor of St. John Goldenbeard, then hast thou made Christ a wine-bibber, and a lover of rare vintages, as if he were a sot, a toper, and a tavern-haunter, even as one of you, and thinkst thou now by a few words of apology to pass this off as a light matter, it is no such thing as thou supposest. Thou hast deserved the fire, and we should but do our duty that we inflict it upon thee. With these and the like words in plenty he upbraided him, bending on him meanwhile a countenance as stern as if Epicurus had stood before him, denying the immortality of the soul. 
In short, he so terrified him that the good man was fain to employ certain intermediaries to anoint his palms with a liberal allowance of St. John Goldenmouth's grease, an excellent remedy for the disease of avarice, which spreads like a pestilence among the clergy, and notably among the friars' minors, who dare not touch a coin, that he might deal gently with him. And great being the virtue of this ointment, albeit no mention is made thereof by Galen in any part of his medicines, it had so gracious an effect that the threatened fire gave place to a cross, which he was to wear as if he were bound for the emprise overseas, and to make the ensign more handsome, the inquisitor ordered that it should be yellow upon a black ground. Besides which, after pocketing the coin, he kept him dangling about him for some days, bidding him by way of penance hear mass every morning at Santa Croce, and afterwards wait upon him at the breakfast hour, after which he was free to do as he pleased for the rest of the day. All which he most carefully observed, and so it fell out that one of these mornings there were chanted at the mass at which he assisted the following words of the gospel, You shall receive a hundredfold, and shall possess eternal life. With these words deeply graven in his memory, he presented himself, as he was bidden, before the inquisitor, where he sat taking his breakfast, and being asked whether he had heard mass that morning, he promptly answered, Yes, sir. And being further asked, Hearest thou aught therein, as to which thou art in doubt, or hast thou any question to propound? The good man responded, Nay, indeed, doubt have I none of aught that I heard, but rather assured faith in the verity of all. One thing, however, I heard, which caused me to commiserate you and the rest of you, friars, very heartily, in regard of the evil plight in which you must find yourselves in the other world. And what, said the inquisitor, was the passage that so moved thee to commiserate us? Sir, rejoined the good man, it was that passage in the gospel which says, You shall receive a hundredfold. You heard aright, said the inquisitor, but why did the passage so affect you? Sir, replied the good man, I will tell you. Since I have been in attendance here, I have seen a crowd of poor folk receive a daily dole, now of one, now of two, huge terrines of swill, being the refuse from your table and that of the brothers of this convent. Whereof, if you are to receive a hundredfold in the other world, you'll have so much that it will go hard, but you are all drowned therein. This raised a general laugh among those who sat at the inquisitor's table, whereat the inquisitor, feeling that their gluttony and hypocrisy had received a home thrust, was very wroth, and, but that what he had already done had not escaped censure, would have instituted fresh proceedings against him in revenge for the pleasantry with which he had rebuked the baseness of himself and his brother friars. So, in impotent wrath, he bade him go about his business and show himself there no more. End of Day One, The Sixth Story Day One, the Seventh Story. Bergamino, with the story of Primaso and the Abbot of Cluny, finally censures a sudden access of avarice in Monsieur Cane de la Scala. Emilia's charming manner and her story drew laughter and commendation from the Queen and all the company, who were much tickled by her new type of crusader. When the laughter had subsided, and all were again silent, Philostrato, on whom the narration now fell, began on this wise. A fine thing it is, noble ladies, to hit a fixed mark. But if, on the sudden appearance of some strange object, it be forthwith hit by the bowmen, tis little short of a miracle. The corrupt and filthy life of the clergy offers, on many sides, a fixed mark of iniquity, at which, whoever is so minded, may let fly, with little doubt that they will reach it, the winged words of reproof and reprehension. Wherefore, though the worthy man did well to censure in the person of the inquisitor the pretended charity of the friars who give to the poor what they ought rather to give to the pigs or throw away, higher indeed is the praise which I accord of him, of whom, taking my cue from the last story, I mean to speak, seeing that by a clever apologue he rebuked a sudden and unwanted access of avarice in Messieur Cane de la Scala, conveying in a figure what he had at heart to say, touching Messieur Cane and himself, which apologue is to follow. Far and wide, almost to the ends of the earth, is born the most illustrious renown of Messieur Cane de la Scala, 
in many ways the favored child of fortune, a lord almost without a peer among the notables and magnificoes of Italy, since the time of the Emperor Frederick the Second. Now, Messer Cane, being minded to hold high festival at Verona, whereof fame should speak marvelous things and many folk from diverse parts, of which the greater number were jesters of every order, being already arrived. Messer Cane did suddenly, for some cause or another, abandon his design, and dismissed them with a partial recompense. One only, Bergamino by name, a speaker ready and polished in a degree credible only to such as heard him, remained, having received no recompense or congé, still cherishing the hopes that this omission might yet turn out to his advantage. But Messer Cane was possessed with the idea that whatever he might give Bergamino would be far more completely thrown away than if he had tossed it into the fire. So never a word of the sort said he, or sent he to him. A few days thus passed, and then Bergamino, seeing that he was in no demand or request for aught that belonged to his office, and being also at heavy charges at his inn for the keep of his horses and servants, fell into a sort of melancholy. But he still waited a while, not deeming it expedient to leave. He had brought with him three rich and goodly robes, given him by other lords, that he might make a brave show at the festival, and when his host began to press for payment, he gave him one of the robes. Afterwards, there being still much outstanding against him, he must needs, if he would tarry longer at the inn, give the host the second robe. After which he began to live on the third, being minded to remain there, as long as it would hold out, in expectation of better luck, and then to take his departure. Now, while he was thus living on the third robe, it chanced that Messer Cane encountered him one day, as he sate at breakfast, with a very melancholy visage, which Messer Cane, observing, said, rather to tease him than expecting to solicit from him any pleasant retort, What ails thee, Bergamino, that thou art so melancholy? Let me know the reason why. Whereupon Bergamino, without a moment's reflection, told the following story which could not have fitted his own case more exactly, if it had been long premeditated. My lord, you must know that Primaso was a grammarian of great eminence, and excellent and quick beyond all others in versifying, whereby he waxed so notable and famous that, albeit he was not everywhere known by sight, yet there were scarce any that did not at least know by name and report who Primaso was. Now it so happened that, being once at Paris in straitened circumstances, as was his lot to be most of his time by reason that virtue is little appreciated by the powerful, he heard speak of the abbot of Cluny, who, except the Pope, is supposed to be the richest prelate. In regard to his vast revenues, that the Church of God can show, and marvelous and magnificent things were told him of the perpetual court which the abbot kept, and how, wherever he was, he denied not to any that came there either meat or drink, so only that he preferred his request while the abbot was at table. Which, when Primaso heard, he determined to go and see for himself what magnificent state this abbot kept, for he was one that took great delight in observing the ways of powerful and lordly men. Wherefore he asked how far from Paris was the abbot then sojourning. He was informed that the abbot was then, at one of his places distance, perhaps six miles, which Primaso concluded he could reach in time for breakfast, if he started early in the morning. When he had learned the way, he found that no one else was traveling by it, and fearing, lest by mischance he should lose it, and so find himself where it would not be easy for him to get food, he determined to obviate so disagreeable a contingency by taking with him three loaves of bread. As for drink, water, though not much to his taste, was, he supposed, to be found everywhere. So, Having disposed the loaves in the fold of his tunic, he took the road, and made such progress that he reached the abbot's place of sojourn before the breakfast hour. Having entered, he made the circuit of the entire place, observing everything, the vast array of tables, and the vast kitchen, well appointed with all things needful for the preparation and service of the breakfast, and saying to himself, In very truth, this man is even such a magnifico as he was reported to be. While his attention was thus occupied, the abbot's seneschal, it now being breakfast time, gave order to serve water for the hands, which, being washed, 
they sat them all down to breakfast. Now it so happened that Primaso was placed immediately in front of the door by which the abbot must pass from his chamber into the hall, in which, according to rule of his court, neither wine nor bread nor aught else drinkable or eatable was ever set on the tables before he made his appearance and was seated. The seneschal, therefore, having set the tables, sent word to the abbot that all was now ready, and they waited only his pleasure. So the abbot gave the word. The door of his chamber was thrown open, and he took a step or two forward, towards the hall, gazing straight in front of him as he went. Thus it fell out that the first man on whom he set eyes was Primaso, who was in very sorry trim. The abbot, who knew him not by sight, no sooner saw him, then, surprised by a churlish mood, to which he had hitherto been an entire stranger, he said to himself, So it is such as this man that I give my hospitality. And, going back into the chamber, he bade lock the door, and ask of his attendants whether the vile fellow that sat at table directly opposite the door was known to any of them, who, one and all, answered in the negative. Primaso waited a little, but he was not used to fast, and his journey had whetted his appetite. So, as the abbot did not return, he drew out one of the loaves which he had brought with him and began to eat. The abbot, after a while, bade one of his servants to go see where the primiso were gone. The servant returned with the answer, No, sir, and, what is more, he is eating a loaf of bread, which he seems to have brought with him. Be it so, then, said the abbot, who was vexed that he had not gone of his own accord, but was not disposed to turn him out. Let him eat his own bread, if he have any, for he shall have none of ours to-day. By and by, Primaso, having finished his first loaf, began, as the abbot did not make his appearance, to eat the second, which was likewise reported to the abbot, who had again sent to see if he were gone. Finally, as the abbot still delayed his coming, Primaso, having finished the second loaf, began upon the third, whereof, once more, word was carried to the abbot, who now began to commune with himself, and said, Alas, my soul! What unwanted mood harborest thou to-day? What avarice, what scorn, and of whom? I have given my hospitality now for many a year to whoso craved it, without looking to see whether he were gentle or churl, poor or rich, merchant or cheat, and mine eyes have seen it squandered on vile fellows without number, and not of that which I feel towards this man ever entered my mind. Assuredly it cannot be he is a man of no consequence who is the occasion of this access of avarice in me. Though he seemed to me a vile fellow, he must be some great man, that my mind is thus obstinately adverse to do him honor. Of which musings the upshot was that he sent to inquire who the vile fellow was, and, learning that he was Primaso, come to see, if what he had heard of his magnificent state were true, he was stricken with shame, having heard of old Primaso's fame, and knowing him to be a great man. Wherefore, being zealous to make him the amen, he studied to do him honor in many ways and after breakfast, that his garb might accord with his native dignity, he caused him to be nobly arrayed, and, setting him upon a palfrey and filling his purse, left it to his own choice whether to go or stay. So Primaso, with a full heart, thanked him for his courtesy, in terms the amplest that he could command, and, having left Paris afoot, returned thither on horseback. Mr. Cani was shrewd enough to apprehend Bergamino's meaning, perfectly well, without a gloss, and said with a smile, Bergamino, thy parable is apt, and declares to me very plainly thy losses, my avarice, and what thou desirest of me, and, in good sooth, this excess of avarice, of which thou art the occasion, is the first I have experienced, but I will expel the intruder with the baton, which thou thyself hath furnished. So he paid Bergamino's reckoning, habited him nobly in one of his own robes, gave him money and a palfrey, and left it for the time at his discretion whether to go or to stay. End of Day One, The Seventh Story Day One, The Eighth Story Guglielmo Borsiere, by a neat retort, sharply censures avarice in Messer Ermino de Grimaldi. Next Philostrato was seated Lauretta, who, when the praises bestowed on Bergamino's address had ceased, knowing that it was now her turn to speak, waited not for the word of command, but with a charming graciousness thus begun. 
The last novel, Dear Gossips, prompts me to relate how a worthy man, likewise a jester, reprehended not without success the greed of a very wealthy merchant, and though the burden of my story is not unlike the last, yet perchance it may not on that account be the less appreciated by you, because it has a happy termination. Know then, that in Genoa there dwelt long ago a gentleman who was known as Messer Ermino de Grimaldi, and whose wealth, both in lands and money, was generally supposed to be far in excess of that of any other burgher then in Italy, and as in wealth he was without a rival in Italy, so in meanness and avarice there was not any in the entire world, however richly endowed with those qualities, whom he did not immeasurably surpass, insomuch as that not only did he keep a tight grip upon his purse when honour was to be done to another, but in his personal expenditure, even upon things meet and proper, contrary to the general custom of the Genoese, whose wont is to array themselves nobly, he was extremely penurious, as also in his outlay upon his table. Wherefore, not without just cause, folk had dropped his surname de Grimaldi, and called him instead Messer Ermino Avarizia. While thus by thrift his wealth waxed greater and greater, it so chanced that they came to Genoa a jester of good parts, a man debonair and ready of speech, his name Guglielmo Borsiere, whose like is not to be found to-day, when jesters, to great reproach be it spoken of those that claim the name and reputation of gentlemen, are rather to be called asses, being without courtly breeding, and formed after the coarse pattern of the basest of churls. And whereas in the days of which I speak they made it their business, they spared no pains to compose quarrels, to allay heart-burnings between gentlemen, or arrange marriages, or leagues of amity, ministering meanwhile relief to jaded minds and solace to courts by the sprightly sallies of their wit, and with keen sarcasm like fathers censuring churlish manners, being also satisfied with very trifling guerdons, Nowadays all their care is to spend their time in scandal-mongering, in sowing discord, in saying, and what is worse, in doing, in the presence of company, things churlish and flagitious, in bringing accusations, true or false, of wicked, shameful, or flagitious conduct against one another, and in drawing gentlemen into base and nefarious practices by sinister and insidious arts and by these wretched and depraved lords he is held most dear and best rewarded, whose words and deeds are the most atrocious, to the great reproach and scandal of the world of to-day, whereby it is abundantly manifest that virtue has departed from the earth, leaving a degenerate generation to wallow in the lowest depths of vice. But, reverting to the point at which I started, wherefrom, under stress of just indignation, I have deviated somewhat further than I intended, I say that the said Guglielmo was had in honour, and was well received by all the gentlemen of Genoa, and tarrying some days in the city, heard much of the meanness and avarice of Messer Ermino, and was curious to see him. Now Messer Ermino had heard that this Guglielmo Bossiere was a man of good parts, and notwithstanding his avarice, having in him some sparks of good breeding, received him with words of hearty greeting and a gladsome mien, and conversed freely with him and of diverse matters, and so conversing took him with other Genoese that were of his company to a new and very beautiful house which he had built, and after showing him over the whole of it, said to him, Now, Messer Guglielmo, you have seen and heard many things, could you suggest to me something the like of which has not hitherto been seen, which I might have painted here in the saloon of this house? To which ill-judged question, Guglielmo replied, Sir, it would not, I think, be in my power to suggest anything the like of which has never been seen, unless it were a sneeze, or something similar, but, if it so please you, I have something to suggest which I think you have never seen. Prithee, what may that be? said Messer Emino, not expecting to get the answer which he got. For Guglielmo replied forthwith, Paint courtesy here. Which Messer Emino had no sooner heard than he was so stricken with shame that his disposition underwent a complete change, and he said, 
Messer Guglielmo, I will see to it that courtesy is here painted in such wise that neither you nor any one else shall ever again have reason to tell me that I have not seen or known that virtue. And henceforward, so enduring was the change wrought by Guglielmo's words, there was not in Genoa while he lived any gentleman so liberal and so gracious and so lavish of honour both to strangers and to fellow citizens as Messer Ermino de Grimaldi. End of day one, the eighth story. Day one, the ninth story. The censure of a Gascon lady converts the king of Cyprus from a churlish to an honourable temper. Except Elisa, none now remained to answer the call of the queen, and she, without waiting for it, with gladsome alacrity, thus begun. Bethink you, damsels, how often it has happened that men, who have been obdurate to censures and chastisements, have been reclaimed by some unpremeditated casual word. This is plainly manifest by the story told by Lauretta, and by mine, which will be of the briefest. I mean further to illustrate it, seeing that good stories, being always pleasurable, are worth listening to with attention, no matter by whom they may be told. To us, then, in the time of the first king of Cyprus, after the conquest made of the Holy Land by Godfrey the Bouillon, that a lady of Gascony made a pilgrimage to the Holy Sepulchre, and on her way home, having landed at Cyprus, met with brutal outrage at the hands of certain ruffians. Broken-hearted and disconsolate, she determined to make her complaint to the king. But she was told that it would be all in vain, because so spiritless and fainéant was he, that he not only neglected to avenge affronts put upon others, but endured with a reprehensible tameness those that were offered to himself, insomuch that whoso had any ill-humour to vent, took occasion to vex or mortify him. The lady, hearing this report, despaired of redress, and by way of alleviation of her grief, determined to make the king sensible of his baseness. So, in tears, she presented herself before him and said, Sire, it is not to seek redress of the wrong done me that I come before you, but only that, so please you, I may learn of you how it is that you suffer patiently the wrongs which, as I understand, are done you, that, thus schooled by you in patience, I may endure my own, which, God knows, I would gladly, were it possible, transfer to you, seeing that you are so well fitted to bear them. These words aroused the hitherto sluggish and apathetic king, as if it were from sleep. He redressed the lady's wrong, and having thus made a beginning, thenceforth meted out the most rigorous justice to all, than in any wise offended against the majesty of his crown. End of Day One, The Ninth Story Day One the tenth story. Master Alberto da Bologna honourably puts to shame a lady who sought occasion to put him to shame, in that he was in love with her. After Elisa had done, it only remained for the queen to conclude the day's storytelling, and thus, with manner de bonheur, did she begin. As stars in the serene expanse of heaven, as in springtime flowers in the green pastures, so, honourable damsels, in the hour of rare and excellent converse is wit with its bright sallies, which, being brief, are much more proper for ladies than for men, seeing that prolixity of speech, when brevity is possible, is much less allowable to them. Albeit, shame be to us all and all our generation, few ladies, 
or none, are left today who understand aught that is wittily said, or, understanding, are able to answer it. For the place of those graces of the spirit which distinguished the ladies of the past has now been usurped by adornments of the person, and she whose dress is most richly and variously and curiously dyed accounts herself more worthy to be had in honour, forgetting that, were one but so to array him, an ass would carry a far greater load of finery than any of them, for all that be not a whit the more deserving of honour. I blush to say this, for in censuring others I condemn myself, tricked out, bedecked, bedizened thus we are either silent and impassive as statues or if we answer aught that is said to us much better were it we had held our peace and we make believe forsooth that our failure to acquit ourselves and converse with our equals of either sex does but proceed from guilelessness dignifying stupidity by the name of modesty, as if no lady could be modest and converse with other folk than her maid or laundress or bakehouse woman, which if nature had intended, as we fain she did, she would have set other limits to our garrulousness. True it is that in this, as in other matters, time, and place and person are to be regarded because it sometimes happens that a lady or gentleman thinking by some sally of wit to put another to shame has rather been put to shame by that other having failed duly to estimate their relative powers wherefore that you may be on your guard against such error and further that in you not be exemplified the common proverb to wit that women do ever and on all occasions choose the worst i trust that this last of today's stories which falls to me to tell may serve you as a lesson that as you are distinguished from others by nobility of nature so you may also shew yourselves separate from them by excellence of manners. There lived, not many years ago, perhaps yet lives, in Bologna, a very great physician, so great that the fame of his skill was noised abroad throughout almost the entire world. Now, Master Alberto, such was his name, was of so noble a temper that, being now nigh upon seventy years of age, and all but devoid of natural heat of body, he was yet receptive of the flames of love, and having at an assembly seen a very beautiful widow lady, Madonna Margarita de Chisolieri, as some say, and being charmed with her beyond measure, was, notwithstanding his age, no less ardently enamoured than a young man, insomuch that he was not well able to sleep at night, unless, during the day, he had seen the fair lady's lovely and delicate features. Wherefore he began to frequent the vicinity of her house, passing to and fro in front of it, now on foot, now on horseback, as occasion best served. Which she and many other ladies perceiving, made merry together more than once to see a man of his years and discretion in love, as if they deemed that this most delightful passion of love were only fit for empty-headed youths, and could not in men be either harboured or engendered. Master Alberto thus continuing to haunt the front of the house, 
It so happened that one feast day the lady, with other ladies, was seated before her door, and Master Alberto's approach being thus observed by them for some time before he arrived, they complotted to receive him and shew him honour, and then to rally him on his love. And so they did, rising with one accord to receive him, bidding him welcome, and ushering him into a cool courtyard, where they regaled him with the finest wines and comfits, which done, in a tone of refined and sprightly banter, they asked him how it was that came about that he was enamoured of this fair lady, seeing that she was beloved of many a fine gentleman of youth and spirit. Master Alberto, being thus courteously assailed, put a blithe face on it, and answered, Madam, my love for you need surprise none that is conversant with such matters, and least of all you that are worthy of it. And though old men, of course, have lost the strength which love demands for its full fruition, yet are they not therefore without the good intent and just appreciation of what beseems the accepted lover? but indeed understand it far better than young men, by reason that they have more experience. My hope in thus old aspiring to love you, who are loved by so many young men, is founded on what I have frequently observed of ladies' ways at lunch when they trifle with the lupin and the leek. In the leek no part is good, but the head is at any rate not so bad as the rest, and indeed not unpalatable. You, however, for the most part, following a depraved taste, hold it in your hand, and munch the leaves, which are not only of no account, but actually distasteful. How am I to know, madam, that in your selection of lovers you are not equally eccentric? in which case I should be the man of your choice, and the rest would be cast aside. Whereto the gentle lady, somewhat shame-stricken, as were also her fair friends, thus made answer, Master Alberto, our presumption has received from you a most just and no less courteous reproof, but your love is dear to me as should ever be that of a wise and worthy man. And therefore, saving my honour, I am yours, entirely and devotedly at your pleasure and command. This speech brought Master Alberto to his feet, and the others also rising. He thanked the lady for her courtesy, bade her a gay and smiling adieu, and so left the house. Thus the lady, not considering on whom she exercised her wit, thinking to conquer was conquered herself, against which mishap you, if you are discreet, will ever be most strictly on your guard. End of Day One, the Tenth Story Day One, the Conclusion of the Decameron as the young ladies and the three young men finished their story-telling, the sun was westering and the heat of the day in great measure abated, which their queen observing, debonnerly thus she spoke, Now, dear gossips, may a day of sovereignty draws to a close, and naught remains for me to do but to give you a new queen, by whom on the morrow our common life may be ordered as she may deem best, in a course of seemly pleasure, and though there seems to be still more interval between day and night, yet, as whoso does not in some degree anticipate the course of time, cannot well provide for the future, and in order that what the new queen shall decide to be meet for the morrow, may be made ready beforehand, I decree that from this time forth the days begin at this hour. And so, in reverent submission to him in whom is the life of all beings, for our comfort and solace we commit the governance of our realm, for the morrow in the hands of Queen Philomena, most discreet of damsels. 
So saying, she arose, took the laurel wreath from her brow, and with a gesture of reverence, set it on the brow of Philomena, whom she then, and after her all the other ladies and the young men, saluted as queen, doing her due and graceful homage. Queen Philomena modestly blushed a little to find herself thus invested with the sovereignty. But, being put on her mettle by Pampinea's recent admonitions, she was minded not to seem awkward, and soon recovered her composure. She then began by confirming all the appointments made by Pampinea, and making all needful arrangements for the following morning and evening, which they were to pass where they then were. Whereupon she thus spoke. Dearest gossips, though, thanks rather to Pampinea's courtesy than to merit of mine, I am made queen of you all, yet I am not on that account minded to have respect merely to my own judgment in the governance of our life, but to unite your wisdom with mine, and that you may understand what I think of doing, and by consequence may be able to amplify or curtail it at your pleasure. I will in few words make known to you my purpose. The course observed by Pampinea to-day, if I have judged aright, seems to be alike commendable and delectable. Wherefore, until by lapse of time, or for some other cause, it grew tedious, I purpose not to alter it. So when we have arranged for what we have already taken in hand, we will go hence and enjoy a short walk. At sundown we will sup in the cool, and we will then sing a few songs, and otherwise divert ourselves, until it is time to go to sleep. Tomorrow we will rise in the cool of the morning, and after enjoying another walk, each at his or her sweet will, we will return, as to-day, and in due time break our fast, dance, sleep, and having risen, will her resume our story-telling, wherein missings pleasure and profit unite in superabundant measure. True it is that Pampinea, by reason of her late election to the sovereignty, neglected one matter which I mean to introduce, to wit, the circumscription of the topic of our story-telling, and its preassignment that each may be able to premediate some apt story bearing upon the theme. And seeing that from the beginning of the world fortune has made men the sport of diverse accidents, and so it will continue until the end, the theme, so please you, shall in each case be the same, to wit, the fortune of such, as after diverse adventures, have at last attained a goal of unexpected felicity. The ladies and the young men alike commended the rule thus laid down, and agreed to follow it. Dioneo, however, when the rest had done speaking, said, Madam, as all the rest have said, so say I, briefly, that the rule prescribed by you is commendable and delectable. But of your special grace I crave a favor, which, I trust, may be granted and continued to me, so long as our company shall endure, which favor is this, that I be not bound by the assigned theme, if I am not so minded, but that I have leave to choose such topic as best shall please me, and lest any suppose that I crave this grace as one that has not stories ready to hand. I am henceforth content that mine be always the last. The queen, knowing him to be a merry and facetious fellow, and feeling sure that he only craved this favor in order that, if the company were jaded, he might have an opportunity to recreate them by some amusing story, gladly, with the consent of the rest, granted his petition. She then rose, and attended by the rest, sauntered towards the stream, which, issuing clear as crystal from a neighboring hill, precipitated itself into a valley, shaded by trees close set amid living rock and fresh green herbage. Bare of foot and arm they entered the stream, and rowing hither and thither amused themselves in diverse ways, till in due time they returned to the palace and gaily supped. Supper ended, the queen sent for instruments of music, and bade Lauretta lead a dance while Emilia was to sing a song, accompanied by Dioneo on the lute. Accordingly, Lauretta led a dance, while Emilia with passion sang the following song. 
so fain I am of my own loveliness, I hope, nor think not e'er, the way to feel of other amorousness. When in the mirror I my face behold, that see I there which doth my mind content, nor any present hap or memory old may me deprive of such sweet ravishment. Where else, then, should I find such blandishment of sight and sense, that e'er my heart should know another amorousness? Nor need I fear lest the fair thing retreat, when fain I am my solace to renew. Rather, I know, twill me advance to meet, to pleasure me, and show so sweet a view, that speech or thought of none its semblance true, paint, or conceive may ever, unless he burn with even such amorousness. Thereon, as more intent I gaze, the fire waxes within me hourly more and more. Myself I yield thereto, myself entire, and foretaste have of what it hath in store, and hope of greater joyance than before. Nay, such as ne'er none knew, for ne'er was felt such amorousness. This ballad, to which all heartily responded, albeit its words furnished much matter of thought to some, was followed by some other dances, and part of the brief night, being thus spent, the queen proclaimed the first day ended, and bade light the torches, that all might go to rest until the following morning. And so, seeking their several chambers, to rest they went. End of Day One Conclusion <laughs>